السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Who was convinced out of his will to come here? Who didn't want to come here? And he was like, you know what? No, no. Let's just go and see. People who, who did not. No, I'm not going to pick on you guys. I just want to know the, the... Yeah, okay. That's just one. Okay. Two. Okay. Because this is going to be a little tough. I'll tell you... Two, two things are going to happen today, inshallah. Um, you're going to make a few decisions. Not together, not as a group. Inshallah, one day we will, as a group. That's the ultimate objective. But uh, we are going to make some conscious choices. My job here is, uh, I'll tell you in detail. Uh, can you get rid of this picture? <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty narcissistic of, uh, no, make sure the, okay. <laughs> Kills the whole objective, isn't it? Thank you, thank you. So, uh, let me just introduce you the, the very purpose of uh, so many people coming together to make this tour happen. And I would like to thank you all to actually show up in camera. This is the first time I, uh, I'm assuming camera is actually going through these sort of movements at a level where everybody comes together in, in these kind of universities and halls talking about core issues. Who is a non-Muslim here? Who's not a Muslim? Everybody? Muslim? Yeah. So you have an eye on me. I need you to keep an ear on me too. Okay. So uh, let me just introduce you the tour. Awakening tour is a two-step process. You don't have to take both of the steps. Actually, you're halfway in the first step already. We're going to do two things. We're going to connect everybody together, inshallah, around the world, from uh, literally Australia to America, literally. Uh, inside a task group. A task group means, you know, some uh, certain activities where all of you guys can come together and help each other get three or four core skills which are required at whatever age you are, because there are different skills required at different age brackets, as a woman, man, child, boy, father, and uh, measure your worth in the bigger objective. Literally measure it in numbers numerically measured. I'll tell you how. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. That's, don't, 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 don't stop the child from being a child. Actually, that's one of the things Muslims are doing really well. We stop the children from being children. Okay. Trust me, nobody else is doing it. We are, and Desis are doing an awesome job at this. Who's not a Desi? Is Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Afghanistan? Yeah. Who's not from these poor countries? Everybody's from here. So we all know what I'm talking about. And there's a reason why I'm not speaking Urdu today. Because this is uh, going to be broadcasted to age groups which do not understand Urdu. That's the only reason. Otherwise, we can do this Urdu. But that's not the objective. See, there, there's a bigger objective at play. I don't want to lose anybody, especially kids. Especially in New Jersey, Miami, Auckland, and hell, in Melbourne, and, and, and you know, Sydney. Because they have been mothers and fathers. The, dis, the gap between a parent and a child, and I'm not, not going to give you this boring mumbo jumbo of all of that, you know, because most of you guys are not parents, and even if you are, parenting is not, you know, the single common topic between, you know, you and her. So I'm going to give you all of those things which are going to be really common, really pertinent, and really juicy. Okay, really juicy, especially girls and boys together. So um, where was I before the the parenting happened? Oh yes, sir. Yeah, I need you guys to keep a little tab on me so that because uh, these things keep happening to me. So there's a two-step process. Awakening is, uh, you know, a general word. 
But it's, it's for, for Muslims, you know what's going on in Gaza. We all know that. But this is not news. This is not news. Uh, what's the biggest problem happening in Gaza? Anybody? I'm just taking it as an example. That's not the problem. Yes, sir. Occupation. Occupation? That's the biggest problem in Gaza? Think about it. The biggest problem of Gaza. Auckland, uh, sorry, camera, come on. This is a, a, a university campus. I need a very acute, surgically placed answer. I think it's a fight between faiths, different faiths are fighting with each other. And it's a charity people are after. A promised land. I'm not going to name a certain religion, but some people think it's a promised land to them. Jews think like this. Why aren't you naming them? The Quran talks about it. Yeah. And uh, they're not so wrong. They are promised. Bani Israel is promised. They themselves claim that Bani Israel is also promised. You know what the Jews, because I've uh, lived with the Jews, I've uh, studied under uh, the tutelage of, not Judaic philosophy, but you know, science, but they were rabbis who taught me science in different universities. But they themselves know that, you know, there are two covenants. The eschatology has only two races. Bani Israel is going to survive, yeah. And Bani Ismail is going to survive. And we all have all the ahadiths. So they know the covenants. It's not just one covenant. In the Quran, Allah says, ask them for what covenant are they referring to. Allah is not denying it. We were told that in this ayah, Allah is denying it. No, Allah says, ask them what is the detail of that covenant. That's what the ayah means. Were they not told to obey and fulfill that covenant through and through? Was that not the covenant? Again, I'm not going to go into detail of that. The question is totally different. What is the biggest problem, well, the only problem, the real problem of Gaza? Yes, ma'am. So the problem is that the, what Jews are doing, they know what they are doing. Uh-huh. No, no, that's half correct. They are the Jews of the Quran. Yes. We are not the Muslims of the Quran. Yes. They are the Jews of the Quran. So you were right there. You just didn't land it. Good job. But don't, that's not the problem. Come on. Yes. They're trying to eliminate the Muslims so they could build a third temple there for the Jews. That's Suleiman al -Salam, our prophet too, you know. So their temple helps us in, in so many other ways. I'm just trying to give a spin on your answer. That's not the real problem of Gaza. I'm trying to open up your brains and minds because this is an icebreaker. I haven't, this is not, nothing to do with my, my, actually has everything to do with my tour, but I just want to build it up, gee. I think it's, a, it's an acutely biased narrative coming out of the powerful side of the camp. It's, it's not Couldn't get the last part of your statement coming out of the powerful side of? The camp. So there are two sides of the camp. One is, one is powerful, both in terms of the military, in terms of the economy and the politics. The other side, side of the camp actually is weak. So it's an extremely biased narrative from that side of the fence that's, uh, that holds the power. <coughs> if there is enough time today, we are going to talk about both the narratives. If, if. Because as I said, uh, we planned this tour. Gaza has been like my, my core subject. Actually, I think I have more research about Palestine and that thing called Israel than uh, most people, as I know, of my age. So we're not going to, because this tour is, is going to carry the burden of Gaza, inshallah. Because we all, you know, are bleeding. I don't think the real problem. The problem is not. There you go. Finally. Finally, so the, the, that's the best answer. So what's your name? Oh, you missed. Okay, you were about to land the plane. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah, generally, yeah, you're right. So the problem with Gaza, the Palestinian, any Palestinian in the house? The problem that Palestinians are facing, the people of Gaza are facing, is not the Judaic philosophy. Absolutely not. They've been here way before the Muslims, let alone Gaza. 
Okay? They never cause problems. The problem with Gaza is the twisted Muslim philosophy. I'll say it again. The problem that Palestinians are crying about, that little children are dying in Gaza, is not America, Israel, or the UN, or Germany, or Australia for that matter, you know, or Luxembourg, or Micronesia. These are three constant votes, Israel, in this case, right? Your country, America, and Micronesia. That's not the problem. Let's admit the truth. Let's start the awakening tour. The people of Gaza are suffering from you and me. We are the disease. Uh, this is as simple and as common a truth I can actually express. A four-year-old child cannot deny it. You know, it's like there's this guy coming in. Or like, I'm just grab this guy, start beating him up. Me and ten other dudes. And nobody else does anything in the room. And then he says, you know, what's the problem? Everybody says, what's the problem? He's going to say, oh, those ten dudes and I was alone. Yeah, you were alone, that's the problem. Ten dudes is not a problem. I'll tell you, let's just flip it and let's do if any one of us, well, you know what, we're too brave about our own selves. If my daughter, your daughter, your sister, or little children of our own homes were to be in Gaza, we would realize the worth of every other Pakistani Indian or you know, any other Muslim. As soon as we put our child in Gaza, we'll know the worth of every other Muslim. That's how you calculate the worth of the whole community. That's how simple. Everybody does that. It's not, I mean, I, I'm not giving you anything new. Okay? So... I just wanted to open your minds up, because today it's, uh, I didn't want to miss out on talking about Gaza. And we can talk about the Judaic philosophy, the Torah and the Talmud for hours and hours. The third temple, the second temple, and the first temple. Actually, before that, the breaking of the tabernacle by Moses salam, himself. We can go as far as back in history. And I've been giving arguments to the Jews. When they say, you know, it's the promised land, you know, it was, we were way before there way before the Palestinians. So I just tell them that why don't you just you know, take Egypt as well because you were cleaning toilets in Egypt way before Gaza under the Pharaoh, right? You want to go history? Yeah, we can, we can build up that argument. But th that's not the point. That's not the problem. And we're not here to open a debate about Gaza. What I'm saying is there's a purpose of this tour. I'll tell you something. And I want to tell you only things which are actually coming from me, about me, and uh, my team, so that I won't tell you, you know, those, those stories from the books. If only, if I only am going to open a book, I'm going to book from the book of Sira, so that you and I can connect each other, with each other, through our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are many philosophies in the world, very many. You name a community, it's going to be backed up by an ideology. That ideology will be connected through some sort of a philosophy in some part of the era. We do not have that sort of uh, misfortune. All of that burden of thinking, you know, philosophy, the theorizing, and then contemplating the bigger truths was done by our Prophet wasallam. We don't have to go through that burden which the Europeans had to go through over and over and over again in the 15, 16, 1700. And so actually till date, the postmodernist philosophers are at it. They have to go every single day, into, you know, recorrecting themselves. And 10 years from any publication of any book, from let's just say Nietzsche to now, this time, you know, or whoever is publishing right now, 10 years from now, it will be refuted. Ironically, Muslims are gifted by the Quran. Now I'm not going to count or give you a ballpark of how many people are trying to refute the Quran, but it doesn't really matter to a regular Muslim, alhamdulillah, that whatever or wherever Quran is trying to be refuted by whoever, doesn't really matter. That is the power that you and I share. Even if, God forbid, God forbid, you know, the whole world starts to try and refute the Quran or rationalize some theory against it. It doesn't really matter to us till today. 
till today, till whatever we can see. Because God forbid, na'udhu billah, may Allah save our children, because we do not know of what's going to happen to our kids. Because maybe the way things are going, maybe, because it's not going to come from outside Islamic circles. I'll tell you this right now. If anything is going to go come against the Quran with enough power to shake the Muslim, it's not going to be from outside the Muslim circles. It has to be a Muslim. Make sure you understand. That's another statement of common sense I'm giving you. It's happened to many philosophies, and groups, and communities. Hell, even a Shia cannot prove a Sunni wrong and a Sunni cannot prove a Shia wrong. Only a Shia can prove a Shia wrong and a Sunni can prove a Sunni wrong to create that deterrent in the bigger number of people inside the community. We all know that. So a Muslim has to create that sort of deterrent. And I'll tell you where those Muslims are, I'll tell you. They are in Pakistan, India, Australia, they are. They're just six years old right now, they're seven, maybe ten. Are they suffering from malnutrition? No, they're being fed really well. They're being air conditioned to perfection. They're being nursed. What they're not getting is that core central element of belief which you and I were gifted with, with the will of Allah Azawajal and the help of our parents. Okay? And I'm going to show you the structure of how it works. I'm going to play two games with you guys, uh, two activities, so that you guys can get connected and understand the structure of this program. We are Muslims, we do not believe in coincidences. In our core philosophy, there are no coincidences. Whatever is happening is designed by Allah Azawajal. So a guy from Pakistan walks around, I don't know how many thousand miles are we from Pakistan? Anybody has ever? 89,000. 89,000? Really? Oh, yeah, that's, that's 25,000 miles is the, the, okay. So about 9,000, well, that's a little less, but okay. Thousands of miles, a guy comes from Pakistan, literally, from Islamabad, the capital, to Canberra, the capital, to, to on a certain date and day, which is pretty, you know, coincidental. And all of you guys, I'm talking about you. Think about your own self right now. Think about the way all of this happened and you ended up in this seat. This is not a coincidence. In Islam, we all believe it's common sense. If you believe in the God that we know that, that He is, there are no coincidences. So that means this is not by chance. I was supposed to say some things and you're supposed to hear some things. Okay, this is not by chance. So something else is going on. That's what I'm saying. More than a million hours, literally, and I, I'm telling you a little less because I do not know the span right now. More than a million hours of public speaking are done every year. And you know, if it were causing any kind of change, this world would have been a way better place. So most of the public speaking sessions go to waste. Because they do not invoke two things. One, they do not un install the right philosophical nodes. And number two, they don't really try to hit the right psychological nodes. I am going to use our common philosophy so I don't have to do that much work. I'm going to invoke the Sira all the time, the life of the Prophet And I'm going to try and get you connected to that, that, that aura, that power that we all gain from through our Prophet and while I'm doing that, I'm going to be connecting through your psychology, through your minds, try and see where your, your, your current systems are in your Canberra psychology. And I'm going to ask you a lot of questions, a lot of questions, so that you and I can talk and I can try and place certain concepts within. Then what's going to happen? This session is going to get over with well, a couple of hours, maybe less, maybe more. We're going to do a lot of questions and then something else is going to happen. We're going to give psychology another chance okay how all of us are going to get connected inshallah today all of us i'm going to give you enough time to get connected to one group whatever whatsapp or facebook whatever okay and we're going to get connected again every at least once in three months two months once a month 
for the follow-throughs of whatever, is up, whatever update we're going to do with this program. Whatever your problems are, we're going to give you academic solutions from it, free of charge, don't worry, through online sessions and uh, coming together. So that I can actually ask you for help, not just get you help, because somebody else would need it and you would have something to give to that person. Maybe knowledge, maybe some skill, maybe some advice, I don't know, it could be anything. Okay? This is how community works. But we're going to make sure only serious people come into it there. And this is how we're going to connect the rest of the Muslim world. Of course, we're going to do a lot of tangible installations in there. I'm not going to commit to it right now, but I'm going to give you a little detail of what my company is doing so that you can understand how real it has become. Okay? And Gaza could not have come in a more critical time. So, let me tell you, and I'm going to ask you, what's the meaning of this? Okay, let me tell you a little story. Tell me what it means to you. Because in current day and age, I am guessing you're not going to get it. Okay? There's this big desert. Imagine that. Imagine this desert in which there's an army, Muslim army, who is looking ahead at the enemy, which is three times the number. There are 3,100 Muslim soldiers <coughs> and about 10,000 enemy, strong, well-built, shining silver armor coming the Muslim way. And this Muslim leader, Nu'man, okay, that's his name, he's standing with the flag in his hand, grounded in the sand, and he's staring right inside those shining armor of that, that, that enemy. All the Muslim soldiers are waiting when Nu'man is going to give the order, and he's just looking. Anyone has heard this? This is a very famous, very famous incident. Okay. Tell me what it means, okay? I'm going to ask you. And I'm going to ask you the most simple question, no trick questions here. Okay, because this is Islam, and this is how far we are from it, and this is why. I'll tell you all women, you're going to feel this. This is why none of you guys can guarantee, none of you guys, that whatever you're going to ask for a prayer today or tomorrow is going to come true. If anything, all of us can guarantee that most of our prayers are not going to come true. And that's exactly what we're all actually thinking to our own selves alone on the Jain Namaz every single day. We have lost the faith in our own prayers. Okay? Let's not sugarcoat anything. We know that we don't pray with an anticipation of a high probability. We all know that. I'll tell you why it happens. Okay, this is why I'm actually trying to wake up everybody. So, no man is standing, this flag is waving, and everybody's waiting for Naman to say, you know, jump in. But nobody can, because this is, this is the rule of Islam, that when the commander, unless the commander gives an order, you cannot do anything. It's way more critical than during a Jama'ah. In the Jama'ah, Imam says, Allah Akbar, everybody says Allah Akbar. You cannot just say Allah Akbar before. But this is not as critical as inside the, the war situation. So Nu'man radiallahu anhu is just standing, just staring, dead eyes, inside the ranks. And everyone's quivering as to what's going on. So one sahabi, he just comes in close to Nu'man, okay? And he dares to say, of course, the, the question everyone's in thinking about. What are you waiting for? Mada tantadir. Mada tantadir. He hears it three times. Tantadir. And then he looks back. And then he looks up. And then he starts staring. And the enemy comes 300 yards inside the range. Okay? I was 12 or 13 when I heard this story. And I asked a simple question to my teacher. He was a Yemeni. And I asked him, 
because you know he was narrating and he was you know this dude had this habit of just going into the details I'm not going into the details okay I'm just building up so that everybody gets connected and I expect you guys to understand and ask that question too and if you don't don't worry about it I'm going to help you because I just want to understand how far are we from each other literally each other right now right here so Noman after the third time this guy asks Noman says Radiallahu says La ara riyaha Aunillah And then he starts looking around and says La ara riyaha launillah La ara riyaha launillah And everyone in the rank starts ringing inside the air You know what that means He says I can't I can't see the winds of Allah's help How can I give you orders? I cannot see them. And everyone's looking at what has Numan is talking about. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, when the army is about very close, about 100 yards they say, Numan starts smiling and says, I see. I see the winds of Allah's help. I see them. and everyone starts rejoicing and the enemy starts panicking as to why these muslims are rejoicing <laughs> so close to attack and everyone is rejoicing saying allah wak but and you know people are just trying to embrace to that allah has helped us come so it seems like a fairy tale doesn't it you tell it to any faith fairy tale any ethnicity it's a fairy tale or you tell it to your kids in New Zealand right now in Australia right now who are 10 or 12 they're going to say it's fairy tale even though they're muslims okay now tell me something before i assume that you know what it means what did numan mean radiyallahu anhu what did he see what did it translate into in the minds of the rest of the sahaba What is this? What's going on here? It's a simple question. What's going on here? Because I think it's uh, the Muslims of those days, they had... They have what? Really see, the word is la ara. Ara means he can literally see, right? It's not about feeling it. It's about seeing it. It's the faith that you don't have. It's the belief that they have. It's time to plug in this... Uh, Uh, I want to plug this in. I want to show you the model of the Sahabi, the Sahabi psychology. I want to show you that the makeup of the Sahabi psychology. Okay, it's not faith. Of course, it is built up on faith, built up on faith. But I'm telling you this right now. Inshallah, if tested, you and I will have a lot of faith, which can literally be, you know, uh, measured into enough of a substance that we can die for it. I think I can vouch for most of you guys that you want. given a chance to die for the faith of Allah azza wa jalla okay i i don't have any doubts about this but so it's not just faith there's something else that they are actually structured into i need you to get your hands into that that machine that so that you can structure yourself into it and your kids i want to tell you a million more stories about little true stories about what what was going on in the time of the prophet sallam but the way they have been told to us has two problems number one There's a bigger piece of the puzzle missing which I'll tell you what it is that's why I'm here and when they're told to us these kind of stories the storyteller himself does not believe in those stories the muslim does not even believe because if you're going to ask him how did ali ibn abi talib did this or umar khattab said no go from the left abu ubeda and abu ubeda is 5000 kilometers down north in 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 syria or wherever and everybody can hear abu khattab saying no no not from the left go from the right and abu ubeda says did you hear umar khattab everyone says yeah it's not just you everybody heard umar khattab's voice coming from the 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 heavens literally even though he was in medina at that time so even the storyteller does not carry the same belief but cuz i'll tell you what's missing I'll show it to you the whole model don't worry There's something I want to tell you before I tell you all of this So anybody Noman 
لا أرى. What does that mean? I don't see. Okay, I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you because we're not trained into Islam. Big, big statement, isn't it? We're not trained into Islam. It's like I'm the only guy. Huh? No, that's not how it works. He did see Allah's help coming. It is not a metaphor. I'll show you what he saw later. But just to help your minds right now, he did actually see Allah's help coming down. Yes. What's your name, ma'am? It's the second time you did this to me. What's your name? Rushna. Rushna. Serotonin Alpha. We're not going to talk about this today. Okay? She's Yeah, so Rushna, give me something. Use words that everybody else can understand. Well, Alexander never claimed that Allah's help is coming. No, even if there was a false statement for, from Alexander saying, you know, I see Zeus descending down upon us. No, he, didn't, he never said that. Even if he did say that, that's a motivational lecture. No man, radi Allah, no, he's not giving motivation to people. Actually, on the contrary, he's stopping. No, Allah is not. Yes, sir. Well, no, not in this case. You came close and you missed it. No. I think you took leadership for all of the Muslims, and that's why. What's your name? Maybe. Explain that, please. I can't expect such a straight on answer. That is the truth. That is what's going on. Marin, how old are you? Yeah, see? We can talk about Islam, but not our age. <laughs> Marine, come on. Yeah, okay, I'll tell you, Marine, uh, not to pick on you. I'm not talking about you. But, you know, women, all generally, you're losing your power. You're losing your power every single day. What if I started acting like I'm 18? Wouldn't I be losing my power? If I start acting like I'm 18, I'm hanging out with 18 year olds trying to do whatever I can wear, whatever I can do to look 18, would you respect me? Or maybe you would like me as a retard. <laughs> you would think of me as a special child. Something broke in my brain, ASD sort of thing. But you would not respect me. You'd feel bad for me or take some pity on me. How come the rules are reversed in your minds? When you think we are supposed to respect you, but you're trying to look 20 years younger? The rules are not reversed. We also like wise women guiding our kids. You understand me? It's a simple rule. Liberate yourselves. Liberate yourselves. Yes, Mahreen, you're right on the money. But can anyone understand what just she just said? Or translate into the meaning of what sahabas were actually, you know, translating all of this into. Mary? They took accountability for all the Muslims in the sense that they were leading them towards a cause set by Allah. And uh, that made the trust from the Muslims towards the leader. And so the leadership brings a lot of responsibility to them. And they were ready to take Okay, uh, I'm not going to give you all the benefits of the doubt here. So let me just translate this. All the Muslims meaning? The Muslims who were the army behind them. Now. See, now, no, 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 no. So, you know what I was thinking? You, you nailed it. Go on, anybody else? But even if you did, uh, uh, even if you, this is, the, if you see, on, on paper, she's right, okay? But she's just, you know, narrowing the scope of that, that, that man and his whole, whole philosophy here. But you're not going to get what, I, my question is still not answered. What did he see? You want me to change the sahabi, change the, the, the date, change the event, same help? You want me to do that? Okay, I'll tell you something. When a Muslim comes into his own core, 
okay, when a Muslim is come to his own core. It can be measured in numbers, literally in numbers. I'll show you the formula, that's why I came here. And I tried to do that in Pakistan, nobody got it. And when people started getting it, they started understanding that the number is too less, okay, because they know how to calculate the worth of a Muslim. And uh, in Pakistan, the worth of a Muslim cannot be as much as it is here in Australia. See? It is not by chance that Allah has brought you here. You can do a lot more here if you only know the math. And for you to know the math, you'll have to attend the first session online for free. Okay? Because I'm doing four chapters. Second chapter is Sydney tomorrow, inshallah. Third chapter is Melbourne. Melbourne is going to be a bigger chapter. We're going to try and break up into a lot of numbers. And fourth, we're going to open the calculator, inshallah. Okay? But you are going to get the concepts. I'm not going to hold this sort of session in Sydney. Sydney is going to be all PowerPoint presentation, go on, because, you know, I've got to cover a lot of content. You, you're my first sample. You're my first draw of Australia. You are going to determine how I'm going to talk to Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth. Plus, I heard that you guys are the elite. Oh. <laughs> you know. I heard it. Sorry. Is it wrong? Perfect. Snotty? You guys are snotty? You look down upon Sydneyites? No? Okay, rumor? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, I know I heard it right? I just want you to say it. Okay, so you are my first draw of Australia. So you need to be a little more expressive. So Noman, Radhiallahu, he saw the sky breaking down. Okay? He saw the sky breaking down. The whole heavens opening up. One Sabi narrates, you know what, let's just keep the Sabi alive for just one second. Abu Sufyan, when he was not a Muslim, he saw the same event happening when? In Badr. And you know what? He's the first man to cry. <laughs> Jibreel has come for that aid of Muhammad. And the, then the Sahaba looked up and saw all the angels descending down. Okay, so it's not just the faith. It's not just the faith that you can see things. When Muslims are going to be in their own, which is the, their, their whole uh, substance, their element, your element, the whole world's going to see. That's the problem, we're not primed to believe. I'm telling you, half of your brain does not even believe me right now, right here. Half of your brain. And the rest of the half is trying to convince the half of the brain that, yeah, you know what? You could be right. Because it is written. That's how big the problem is. You know why it started? I'll tell you when it started, in, in your case, okay? And where's the camera? Not for Scandinavia, not for Canada or America, for Australia especially. It started 20 years ago, 30 years ago, no less, no more. With somebody who tried to, 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 to come out of Pakistan or India or wherever you're from, to Australia. So, let me ask you a question. Anybody who's more than 20, but less than 30? Anybody? Under 30? You guys are seriously into this age thing, aren't you? <laughs> okay, anybody who's of any age. <laughs> yes, sir. Boy. Yes, boy. Yes, yes. Little, little, little. What's your name? Uh, Rayan. Rayan. Okay, Rayan, how old are you? Six. <laughs> That's quite a leap, buddy. Twelve. You're twelve? You're twelve years old. You are 12 years old. Are you sure? Who said six? Nobody said six. Okay. The 12 years. Ryan? Ryan, you're born here? Are you born here? Were you born here? No, you're not born here. Okay. Okay. So who brought you here, Ryan? I need the name of that guy, Ryan. Who brought you here? Your dad? Where is he? Yeah, okay. What's his name? What's his? No, no. Keep them. Keep them. 
Aslam, okay. Rayan Aslam. Rayan? Yeah. I'm going to ask you, uh, ask your father a question and I need you to answer it, okay? See, Aslam Sahib? Why did you come to camera? Rayan? Because this school is at <laughs> Really? Uh-huh. Where did you come from, Kathmandu? <laughs> the schools are better here, and that's why we brought you. Okay. So you go to what? Which school do you go to? Uh, Forest Primary School. So the primary education is better here. Yeah. Okay. Good job, Aslam Sab. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, you convinced the 12-year-old. Okay. Now you know what I'm asking about, right? You know, you know what I'm talking about. Anybody who's uh, not going to school, please raise your hand so that you won't pull that excuse on me. No, no, not going to school, old enough people who have a career. Okay, let me just teach you a little bit of psychology, just a little bit. Okay, juicy, it's, you're going to love it, you're going to love it. Okay, academic stuff, but you're going to love it. Actually, you would want to be in psychology after this. You know what a salute and a solvent is? Heard this word? Anybody from you guys explain what a salute is and a solvent? From the back. Rayan, did you, Rayan, 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 did you learn this in chemistry in your school right, as, by, by now? Solvent and salutes? Okay, it's all right, it's all right. Anybody, come on, camera, yes. So what the salute is, it says in any solution, the element which is going to be dependent on the, in, uh, which is going to be lesser in quantity, which will be dependent on the climate set by the independent element is the salute. Okay, I get it. We, we all know that, right? We all knew that, right? Salute solvent. If you didn't know that, then I'll change the angle, don't worry. I'm going to change the angle. No? Everybody knew this? Okay. That's how human minds work, okay? God has made us through, through chemicals. These chemicals make combinations, okay? And my chemicals are making combinations with your chemicals right now. Right now, right here. My brain chemicals are making combinations with your brain chemicals. Okay? This is not like metaphysical mythology. No, this is basic chemistry. That's why you can feel bored, excited, motivated, repulsed, okay? Or, or, or you know, you, you can actually feel excited. That's all chemistry, okay? So serotonin goes high, dopamine goes high, and uh, a little bit of adrenaline goes high, you feel excited, okay? You add a little bit of uh, vasopressin in there, you feel motivated. Same com- cocktail, okay? You feel a little more, you know, oh, cortisol in there, you feel uh, as if you're going to conquer the world, okay? That's how chemistry works. Just like that, why I'm asking about solvent salute is because... Uh, Rayan was brought into Canberra. You were also brought into Canberra. Nobody came here on his own. That's job one that we're about to solve. Okay? You're going to solve this job, uh, solve this problem as job one so that you can become independent now. Because if you, somebody brought you here, you were dependent. Rayan is dependent on? Aslam, yeah. So Aslam brought Rayan. Rayan had nothing to do with it. So Rayan is naturally going to reap the benefits, inshallah, or if anything bad happens, it's on Aslam. It's not on Rayan. We all know that. Yeah? Till, of course, Rayan becomes an adult. And when he's an adult, then he's on his own. Aslam, you all know that, right? So you made a conscious choice to bring Rayan and his mother and other of his siblings how many? Uh, one. So two siblings, two. So you, you are four people? Yeah. So when did you come to Canberra? Uh, I, mean, I mean Australia. No, just 20, oh, you just recently came in. Two years. Two years. From where? Uh, 
Abu, okay. From where to Abu Dhabi? Okay. So you know where I'm coming from, right? <laughs> Try and get the drift. You're Indian or Pakistani? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so, Aslam, <laughs> stay with me, man. Stay with me. So, Aslam, how old are you? <laughs> What's going on, guys? Yeah, seriously. <laughs> this is the first time I'm going through this. And this is not even Pakistan. This is like, you, all, everybody had a driver's license. Everybody knows how many, how many years you put in. Uh, you, uh, do you have an Asian driver's license here? Uh, or a health card, right? So, so where were we? Aslam. So, somebody convinced you into moving. Who was that? Your wife. <laughs> no, you seriously. Your wife, really? <laughs> okay. That's the first. Where is she? She's here? Oh, you're here. The queen has entered the building. Your Highness. Ma'am, what's your name? No, Shava. No, Shava? You call the Shahs on many things. Uh, Rayan, his sister, Aslan Saab. You call the Shahs on yourself as well. Who convinced you to move to Australia? Because you convinced everybody else. No. Nah. Nobody convinced you. So thank God. Somebody said it, right? So that's what I wanted to hear. That no, sir, what are you talking about? Nobody forced me to come to Australia. You know, you should have the, 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 the simple uh, sense of understanding, simple sense, that you didn't think about Australia on your own, even though you knew Australia as a country when you were, what, four, five, six in geography class. You didn't think about going to Australia until, of course, something happened. Okay, and that's not some, just one thing. So many things come in together to form this, this little thought process. I'll tell you a little test of that thought process. You put an American, an Australian, and a Pakistani, or an Indian, in a room for seven months. Okay, seven months. What's your name, ma'am? Madiha. Madiha. Men. Okay, so you don't have to be a party to this. You can give a straight answer, right? There are four men. A Pakistani, Indian, American, and an Australian in a room for seven months. Listen to the question. That's how chemistry works, okay? In seven months later, what is the accent of the room? Yeah, didn't think about it. Think about it. It's a simple test of psychology. Don't jump to conclusions. Think. You put an Indian, Pakistani, but same thing, don't worry. A little harder cheese on India. Who's Indians? Where are the Indians? No. It's all right. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Good job. Kal <laughs> match aaja match. Good job. Good job. <laughs> Australian and American. I know, I know, I know. I didn't, see, I didn't give you that, that, that appendage. I didn't want, I, I didn't say it. I want your brain to do that, that thinking of you. Madhya, come on. You can't take, cheat on this one. Just give a wrong answer. It doesn't matter. American. American. Why? Uh huh. Who else has an answer? Seven months. Okay, give me a year, okay? Seven months is not the trick here, okay? <laughs> yeah, I just... Why, why do you have to... Just, just raise your hand. Yeah. There you go. What's the <laughs> It has nothing to do with nationality. I tricked the question in. What your brain is going to listen to is going to become. That's how it is. Okay, that's why I said India or Pakistan doesn't matter. It's just a harder T. I was trying to give you hints all over the place. So, Noshaba, somebody painted a picture in so many times in front of you that all of a sudden you were willing to put your marriage on the stake to move from Abu Dhabi to Canberra. Okay? 
And it could have been a battle, I'm not saying it was. It could have been a very cruise control negotiation and all of a sudden Aslam was like, hey, you know what? You said it, you got it. Happy anniversary, Australian immigration. <laughs> I don't know, could be. Or it could be, nahi jana. <laughs> yeah, you know, calling each other's mothers. Ammi, aap karein, aap baat karein, aap. You know, it could be anything. I don't know how, how the whole you know, spiral went down. Was it easy or hard? Mishaba? Easy? It was a long decision or a short decision? Long decision. Okay, so, so you negotiate it. You negotiate it. Okay. So I'll tell you what happened, okay? This is a problem that you all have to solve. I'm going through a lot of slides. When I'm going to open the slideshow, most of the slides will be covered, don't worry. And I'm going to give you the slideshow, okay? Make sure, uh, Ali, uh, I need everybody connected together in the group because I'm going to be sharing so much stuff with you and we'll be talking live, inshallah, a lot about real things, about next two, three, four steps that I need you to take, okay? Uh, Nushaba. Bear with me. Do you know your husband? Really? Yeah. yeah it's a good thing that you thought about this. <laughs> no, no, yeah. It's a good thing, yeah. Because you didn't just, it wasn't an emotional answer, she thought about it. She was like, hold on. Yeah, I know him really. <laughs> Yeah, because, you know, because there's so much that we do in front of our wives that is called acting, posing. So it takes a little while before the woman starts to see through us. Like, <laughs> I, I'm not going to tell you that I know you now, <laughs> but I know you. Okay, so you know him. How long did it take? How many kids did it take? Now, it, you're going to know a totally different guy. That's the point I'm trying to make. As soon as this kind of transit happens, men, especially, you know what I'm talking about, because I do not know about the Canberra girls, especially the immigrants, but I know the Pakistani men, the Indian men. As soon as you're going to go through this sort of transition, the bigger solvent is Australia now. And you are the salute. Your philosophy becomes a salute. You know what that philosophy is called? Islam. That's the problem I'm trying to solve for our kids. All of a sudden, Islam becomes a salute. And it's okay, Islam has enough power. But you know what, uh, what happens when Islam becomes salute? When Islam as a philosophy becomes a salute, what are we supposed to do? Change the salt. Okay. No, no, think about it. When was the last time it happened? Come on, think common men rocket science wall push me up say. No, no, absolutely not. What was the most famous of this event? Very close. Who who said that? Marine. If I had golden stars then you know, I would have given you that. No, it happened when Allah Azza told Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that this, this is the job. First time, Pali Bhai. First time. All of a sudden, he is a salute, the world is a solvent. Islam, in its true essence, is a salute. And you know what he did? He turned it into a solvent. Okay? That's literally the same process Prophet Sallallahu is keep on telling us. Now you're going to see the hadith about immigration, you're going to find out. And I'm going to look into the camera. And then I'm going to tell you. And I'm not saying this is exactly what's upon you, so don't take any credit out of it. Even though you should understand the academic value is literally upon you, okay? I am narrating you based on, of course, good intents though, that the highest of all rewards is for the martyr who died, gives his life, the biggest shahada, the shahada means testimony, that's the literal meaning of shahada in Arabi. I testify, I am so sure of it, 
then I'm literally willing to bet my life on it. And here's my life. Oh, Allah Azza wa Jal. That you are Haq and your Prophet is the last Haq and this book is the last Haq. And I'm going to give my life on it. Here you go. And he does. That's called the Shahada, the Shaheed. The Shahada means testimony, right? After that is Hijra. That's how high Hijra is. You know what Hijra is, right? Migration. The word is in immigration. When you actually migrated, it's technically, technically speaking, I'm not saying it's upon, you know, you, you qualify. I hope you do. What I'm saying is, immigration is the highest reward in Islam. Highest! Of course, top in the ranks. You know what I'm saying. Because, you know, because they're a little... Two or three things higher than this. Only two or three things. Why? Someone who's not spoken to me yet. Especially a girl who's in her 20s. Why is hijra such a big reward in Islam? Any girl. Except the ones who I've spoken to. Think... See, I'm giving you simple questions through Islam. Pertinent to you, you are all immigrants here. Yes, ma'am, what's your name? How old are you, better? 14. Best, best age to know about this concept. Fatima, put her, say it. Yeah, I know, but do what for the sake of Allah? Doing anything for the sake of Allah is awesome. Migration. Why is this such a big reward? No, you can do that. You can do that without migrating. Think. Think. I'm telling you, there's a problem. There are seven slides in my deck which are narrating the existential crisis of Muslim because of Muslim clerics. Because they're not narrating the weight and the right angle to look at this hadith, this ayah. All of the collection of this hadith and ayah. And I'm just trying to give you the prism. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to give you names of, you know, this cleric, that cleric. No, no, no. Keep listening to your clerics. Don't worry. There's a lot of benefit that you're going to get out of it. But you need to understand where is the problem? Ji Fatima, Fatima. Yes. Because of the sacrifice you go for? Yeah, give me that sacrifice. What is that sacrifice? Um, moving away from what is that sacrifice? Moving away from? Your which, which means what? Migrating. No, no, moving from your home. home. Home meaning what? The people, the people meaning what? Uh -huh. The Muslim, the people, your people. What were they giving you which is no more available? Uh huh, uh huh. That's a, somebody should write this down. This is gold, this is gold mine. Okay, this is a gold mine. She's spilling gold here. Support, comfort. What else? Love. Love. Encouragement. Okay, what else? Who? How old are you? Who's helping you? <laughs> Support, huh? Love. This is not love, you know, this is cheating. <laughs> Fatima, let me explain to you how it works. Everybody should know that. The deed of Hijra is so big, so big, that there was a competition between the Habsha immigrants and the Medina immigrants. Medina immigrants and the Habsha immigrants. Okay. Let's not go into that detail, but you know, we all know that you know, the biggest of all rewards is for the, the immigrants. Okay, why? Because they get what? They get the prophetic mission directly. That's how simple it is. Now, you're not a prophet, but you're going to live a life of a prophet. The troubles of a prophet. The struggles of a prophet. The mission of a prophet. Literally the problems of a prophet. But you're not a prophet. Because the prophets are no more. That's the last prophet, that's it. No more prophets. 
And now what? Now you're going to live the life of literally a prophet. How? Everyone's a salute, solvent, I'm the only salute. All the problems. Identity crisis? Yes. Uh, let me just show you now, because this is not going to be enough for me to just keep talking about this. You need to see the whole funnels. Identity crisis, psychological and emotional both. Existential crisis comes under psychology. What does that mean? What does that actually mean? You know what it means? So you can teach the world what it means because Aslam and you went to the first job interview here. That was the day that many times you replayed that movie in Abu Dhabi with Nushabas, like what the hell was I thinking? And the worst thing was not about the interview. The worst thing was when you got the interview, the next day you walked in like a new animal in the zoo. Everybody was looking at you. Nobody cared, but you thought everybody had a certain statement to give. Even nobody cared. But you made up all of those statements in their eyes. That's what they're thinking. Should I dress up like this? Should I talk like this? Should I walk like this? I mean, a million ways to interpret, actually misinterpret. Put words into your own figments of imagination, which people didn't even think about, and now you're, you're you know, gushing in this canvas of paint that you've actually thrown in your own mind about people. Most of the time, times, that is what people are thinking. That's how you actually put all of that paint together. I'm, that's, I'm just saying, maybe in your case they weren't, but you did put something together. That pressure, that expectation of not being white, not having that accent, not having that grammar. Accent is stage two, grammar is stage one. You know, I am not, I don't know you, Islam, but I know men, I swear, I know men in Canada. I know men in America. Grown men. For the first two, three years, they used to find spots so that nobody can look at them and they should cry. I, I've spoken, you know, I was a little boy. I was two and a half when I, was, when I went to America. You know, I was little young. My father was exiled. There's this... Uh, uh, call center in uh, Young and Bloor in, in Toronto. And I was uh, managing this customer care department and there's this call center that comes under customer care. It's, you know, it's a regular uh, weekday. Understand, you know, I'll tell you why I'm you somehow cannot say the statement so well because every time I think about this guy, it just uh, breaks me down. Men do not tell you because that's not their job to tell you because they don't want to show you how weak things make them because their job is to protect you. Your husbands I'm talking about, your fathers I'm talking about, your brothers. They're never going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you this right now because I know this is real. This is not, you know, Einstein's equations. I went downstairs and uh, I, there was an over, it's, it's overlap shift called, it's a big shift comes in and the shift is uh, still on the floor. So we have to control the coming in shift, incoming shift and make sure the, the occupancy remains intact. It's just a standard call center operation. It's a 14 floor building, okay? And uh, there's this, this guy who I'm actually eyeing out because he's in, still in training. First day he got that work permit, it's called the SIN number in Canada. So he just got his, uh, he's, he's legal to work. And he's got this little twinkle in his eye that, you know what, I'm legal, legally eligible to work. And I know how happy, he's an old man, he's not 20. He's maybe, maybe he's 50, maybe he's a little close to 50, but he seems as if he's 60 or 70, because he's seen that struggle. But he's not 60 or 50, don't think about it like this. And one of these doors open into the parking and he's smoking outside, okay? And he's not supposed to, because there's a law in Canada, you cannot smoke under a... Uh, yeah, cover. And not just a cover, even a, an umbrella, a gazebo. You can't even smoke under a gazebo. You know, you have a gazebo here? That's what you call them here? Yeah. So, somebody else's gazebo, yeah, it's on $1,000, right on the spot. 
So this guy smokes, because he's too new, he doesn't understand the rules. And I just look at him, he's, a, he's, a, he's an Indian by the way. And I go to him, and he's pacing, pacing, pacing. And uh, I'm just going to give you the little, you know, end of the story. Because we all know that. All of us know that. And I go to him and I said, uh, what's going on? And he, in his broken accent and grammar, tries to impress me because he thinks his job depends on it. So I grab him with his shoulders and I was like, kya hua? Mujhe asli baap bataye, hua kya? Because uh, he said, kuch nahi hua. And, you know, he's just trying to pose so that he wouldn't lose his job. So I was like, let's sit down. You want uh, to smoke, you smoke, but don't smoke here. Uh, because you're going to get in police trouble, not job trouble either. But something else is bothering you. Because I know I have his report for the last couple of weeks. And his name is Ishfaq. Okay, Ishfaq. And I said, Ishfaq, sir, how bad do you need this job? He said, uh, I mean, you know, it's his first job in Canada. So everybody thinks his first job is the last job. You know, that's how we think I, because, you know, we made it. But... I'm going to cut to the chase. I have never seen a man cry the way he cried, trying to control but can't control because all he's doing is doing num numbers on the number of dollars per hour, multiply by number of hours, multiply by working days, divided by the first two or three expenses that his wife and kids are naturally going to incur. And he's done this math. And he's trying to calculate how many hours is he going to put over time in his head, you know? And he's got to divide all of that by 100. At that time, the dollar was 84, okay? And he's done that. Multiply that by 84 so that he can send his mother that money. And you know, all of that, you know the math. You don't know the math if you're, if you're, you're old enough. Uh, but if you're too recent, you know the math, okay? If you're family back home, you know the math. I'm going to open the math in front of you, don't worry, okay? Not here, but I'm going to send you that math because that's one of the ways, one of the funnels of how you calculate what's your contribution towards the bigger. That's what makes you Numan, a percentage of Numan. That, that does make you. Allah in the Quran says, That every dollar that you're going to actually contribute is going to construct that building. And that building is going to enforce anyone, in any inhabitant, inhabitant of that building to see Allah, the, the help of Allah, for all Muslims in Gaza and Pakistan and India and everywhere. So I speak to this guy and I'm like, why are you in Canada, man? That's the bigger question. Not about what kind of job do you have or not. What are you doing here? You have a common And I'm that guy, you know, I, I, I'm that guy, I'm sorry. Sometimes it doesn't really, I'm not a good person because I'm that personality type which actually just jumps into the conclusion of trying to help that guy and just cut it, cut to the chase and say, you know what, you should go back. And if you want me to help, I'll help you. I'll buy a ticket. I'll talk to your wife and your mother, whoever is responsible. But if you're going to stay in Canada, you are going to cause more damage to your personality. You're going to go into depression or you're going to do zulm, which they're going to curse you for. And you're going to actually create polluted mut mutants who, who are going to hate their father and make, they're going to make sure they hate Islam because you are a Muslim. You are not capable to, ha to raise Muslims because you're worried about things which are something you cannot even handle. You're doing math more than your brain can, can handle. And you are not fit for this job anyway. This is an English communication job. And you just don't have it. I mean, I piled up as much as I could so that I can convince him. I'm just telling you this right now. I know when man of salute comes into a solvent. All of the identity of the solvent is absorbed by the salute. And in the first draft, that's not Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, Australian. No, that's just human. That's how human mind works. And as much as we think girls are more vulnerable or naive, that works way more for men than for women. 
We want way more of that identity of the solvent than they want of the bigger solvent. They do not want to be the white woman. Test it, and I have tested it, everybody has, not just me. It's an academic review I'm giving you. Most Desi women don't want to be white women. But all of the Desi men want to be white men. Yes. That's the problem. And that's why you keep staring at those goatees. So what the hell is he looking at? Because you don't want to be that. I know who you want to be, so I'm not giving you a free pass here. What I'm saying is, you're going to catch an Australian accent 10 years later than your counterpart man. That's how slow you want it. And we have an excuse that, you know what, if you didn't, didn't get that English or that, 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 that slang or that, or if you're not woke enough, we're not going to get in. And if you're not going to get in, we're not going to stay. And I'm doing this for you, woman. The bills, the grocery, and the, you know, your, your, your whatever clothes that you want to buy. I'm doing this for you. Doing what for me? I'm going away from you for you. I'm becoming a solvent for you. I'm not going to be able to relate to you for you. That's what you're going to do. And that's okay. You're old enough to handle yourself. That's not okay for Rayan. Aslam, Rayan is half lost. I guarantee you this right now. Mushaba, that debate in Abu Dhabi did not help Rayan. It can, it can. You can channel it. But that's, what we, that's the job. That is the job. Because so many Rayans are losing their track. And so many Fatimas are actually asking the right questions from their fathers and mothers. And you know what the reply they're going to get? Bacha even though 99% of the questions are 100% correct, they should have. We should have asked our parents that question or those questions about Islam, philosophy, you know, the, the reasoning of it all. But since we're not trained into it, Islam, we all know what you're going to do to Rayan when he's going to ask you those blunt, blatant questions, and especially Nushaba, because you guys, girls are emotional, you're going to shun it out of the system. And he's not going to get shunned out. You know who is going to answer Rayan's question? Peter Douglas, next door. Yeah. They're not going to be the right answers, but they'll be such a good looking answer. And he's not of the age to reason himself out of right or wrong. At least somebody's giving him the answer. And trust me, even big scholars of Islam can't reason out of a lot of answers which are wrong, but given on YouTube. Big scholar, I'll repeat this. A lot of big scholars of Islam cannot reason themselves against the wrong answers on YouTube against Islam. So you think 8-year-old, 10-year-old kids are going to do that? They're never going to do that. You want to give you 20 top examples of wrong answers given by Muslim scholars on YouTube, which any child can refute, but they're not going to because it, they don't know the Sira or the Quran or the literature. That's how identity is going to get shattered. You know, till the 1980s, number one religion immigrating to atheism was Hinduism. Did you know that? Read the stats. Till the 1980s, most of the atheists were Hindus before atheism. But something happened in the 80s and 90s. You know what that is? YouTube, technology, internet. And now do the math. And I don't want to do the math on, you know, religions and cultures and whatever. I want to do the math on age. At what age are Human beings calling themselves atheists. And you know what that is today? 12. 12 year old. 12 year old kids are calling themselves atheists. They can't even call themselves girls or boys properly. And they think they're atheists.
I don't know about Australia, but in its eight-year-old child can call himself, himself, a girl. You call it the pronoun, right? In Canada, he's legally, he is legally allowed to call himself a girl. And okay, I get this gender identity crisis. Okay, big problem. You think that's as big of a problem as my own child becoming an atheist and becoming an activist? You know who's the most activist now? Three generations of immigrants in Scandinavia, Muslims. Which is the most active generation? Scandinavian Muslims, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Arab. The first generation that migrated to uh, Scandinavia couldn't even speak Danish or Swedish or Finnish. Second generation were born there. Third generation started moving into politics now. Who is the sitting senator of Australian embassy, uh, parliament here in this room? Is there any senator here? Any senator? Nobody is a senator here? Nobody is a member of parliament here in this room? I know it's such a redundantly dumb question, isn't it? Because there is not even a chance. Your kids, Aslam Rayan, can he go to the, the parliament? Yeah, because he's right in the age, of course, he, if he does. But probability is less. But his kid, Aslam, his kid, there's way more probability of him, more, I'm not saying equal, more probability of Rayan's child being in the parliament than Frank Rutherford in Sydney. Any, any Tom, any Joe, because he's got a motive and he's got a regime. Those people will not have that regime. You got a regime going on. I'll tell you that in some other day. That's what happened to Scandinavia. It's a common example. Now, English, England, England has a brown prime minister. Prime minister, not a senator. His last generation were senators and members of parliaments. Four generations ago, they couldn't even think about it. So the speed is, you know, triple. You were moving with triple the speed. I'll, I'll tell you some other day, inshallah, what is the cause of that speed. But right now, is just understand the speed. So, Ryan, yes, hopefully, he can make it to the parliament in Australia. By the time he's 25, 26, maybe 30, okay? If he's of age, he can understand. What does he require? He requires two things. That's exactly what he's getting right now. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Ryan, you know what he's getting right now? Aslam, what is Ryan getting right now? He's going to make him able to be in the parliament. Yeah, number one, he's got to be more Australian than any other Australian. Who is already an Australian? More than the Aboriginal Australian. He's got to be way more Australian. What has he got to prove? What's your name, ma'am? Yeah, anybody one of you. Yeah? Fayal. Fayal. Fayal? What is Rayan? What does he have to prove to be an Australian to any other Australian? Really? Self-respect? That's the first thing they'll lose. Okay. Jee, uh, anybody? Ek bande ko, yeah, yeah. There you go, what's your name? Yeah, you gotta know how quick you can divorce your current identity. Because you cannot have two different identities. You can have a brown skin and still be Australian. But you gotta be totally Australian. Arnold Schwarzenegger cannot be the president of USA, but he can be the governor of California. You know what I'm saying? Adnan Khwaja can be an amazing, what's his name, a cricketer in Australia. Yeah? He's an he's Australian as it gets. But Ryan, for a uh, member of parliament, you got to be twice the Australian. Uh, one, twice means one fully Australian Australian, which is Frank or Samantha or wherever. And the other Australian is the... Uh, Lack of Pakistan in you or India in you. Where is the proof of that? That is something which you have to. And that's what this English Prime Minister is trying to prove every single day in front of you. He could have easily taken the fairness route. You know what he took? He took the English route. 
What's his name? Rishi. Rishi became uh, a lot more, you know, uh, Richard <laughs> than any Richard would ever walk the streets of England. No Richard has been so Richard than Rishi. <laughs> because Rishi was twice Richard. He had to be twice the Richard, any Richard. Richard the king, which is, he couldn't even dream of becoming so Richard. He became so Richard that he went on Twitter and he misspelled Israel to promote Israel. He did it in such a jiffy. And he put the Palestinian pictures by mistake on Twitter thinking they were Israeli kids. Calling it an abomination. And then he had to take him down because somebody told him, oh dude, these look like brown kids. <laughs> Just because you're Rishi or you're Richard. Not everybody has become richer, man. Just take these brown kids off, put some Jewish kids up there. But there's no picture of some, any Jewish kids. So where are you going to find any kids? Which are going to prove that lie that they are putting on Muslim. Anyway, you get that? Aslam. So, there, is it a fault? No, it's not a fault. It's a demand of uh, Muslims as well. You want a member of our parliament, you got to be twice the Muslim if your name is Shankar. If your name is Shankar, you got to prove that you're not Shankar, man. Well, it's not their fault. It's common sense. Shukla sahab, kalma padho ki to andar masjid mein aoge na. Any shukla, yaan pe bhi hote na, shukla sahab. So when your neighbor, your Indian, your friend, you cannot be like, shukla sahab, lion begum ne khani mein kya banaya khal. No, you'll be like, oh, hold on, shukla sahab, we can't just put anything of your house in our mouth because... You have to be twice Rashid Saab. Twice the Rashid Saab for me to eat from your house. So it is not, oh my God, these Aussies are so racist. No. Nobody's a racist. It's their survival. They need to survive really well and it's called harmony principle in psychology. You need to be under the same tutelage of philosophy in our values. That's what I'm saying. Let's just take a little 10 minute breather because I've put too much together and I wish I can actually. Uh... Solvent salute, everybody understands. So, an Australian going into America it has to become an American. I'm sorry. If, if he has to, you know, survive into a career and, and develop a family, grow, and, you know, get into, get into the game, which you and I, as men, Sorry, we need not just to get into the game, we need to win it. Because if you're not going to win it, we are going to have twice the depression because we took a lot of decision coming to a totally different country, especially as close to the end of the planet as it can be. Because a hundred miles down and there is no more planet Earth. So you came right on the edge of the planet to prove some worth that you already have in your own mind. Inshallah you will. But who are you trying to prove? That's the real question. If you're trying to prove it to yourself, okay, we'll work on it. If you prove it to uh, your next Dorazi, then we have a different problem your child is going to inherit, okay? Now, what is, uh, the, what is the identity that you're losing? That's the bigger question. That's where I cannot help you by just talking about this. I need to open up a lot of uh, slides in front of you so that you can understand what are we giving up, what is going to happen, and how no Muslim right now, how no Muslim right now can understand the solvent psychology. Because we are, as Muslims are not solvents anymore. Even in Pakistan, India, even in Makkah and Medina, we are not solvents. Muhammad bin Salman, not a solvent. That's the problem, and that's exactly where this session is going to get a little deeper, a little more technical. And that's why as fathers and mothers, you better understand how important this tour is. That's where the real shake is. And I don't want to just shake you to break you, I want to shake you to remake you. So, uh, let me ask you a question. 
Who knows about any, I'm not going to name names. Give me your name, the favorite scholars that you listen to. Come on. Tariq Jamil, okay. Tariq Jamil, okay. One, 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 okay. Love that guy. Love, I absolutely love him. Everybody loves that guy. I don't think anyone in the world hates that guy. Okay. What, who else? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, people who are alive right now. Numan Ali Khan. Okay. I want to get back to, uh, back to Olaki. I'll, I'll get back to Olaki. Because he, he is going to, you're going to have an answer which I'm going to ask everybody else. <laughs> Nobody else is going to have that answer, okay? Okay? So, if you know the answer, just raise your hand, because I don't know if you actually did listen to all of whatever you had to say. So, Nawal Khan, who else? Menk, Menk, okay, Menk, awesome, awesome, awesome. What's he saying? Ayman. Akhi Ayman, Ayman, okay, yeah. Hamza Yusuf, okay. Big names, I, you got big names, okay. What, uh, anybody else? Nobody, nobody listens to anybody from Canada. It's, it's all America. See, America is everywhere. <laughs> Yasser Qadi. Okay, Yasser Qadi. Yeah, yeah, Yasser Qadi. I know, I know him, Yasser Qadi. That's the first man who I know who I've listened to, okay? Other than Dr. Sarado. Sheikh Imran, yes. Oh, yeah, another guy I've, I've... No, I heard you the first time. Go on. Yeah, third time. I heard you the first time. You don't have to say it three times. Okay, all of these co uh, clerics combined, except for you, sir, okay? Don't raise your hand. All of these clerics combined. What did they tell you? And if you know, only then raise your hand. If they didn't tell you, if they didn't tell you, because I know they didn't tell you, but if they told you, raise your hand. What is the purpose of Islam? If this, no, 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 not that, no. see, that's exactly why I didn't, this is the difference. That's why these people are gems, these are, this is jewelry. You don't have Bayan al-Quran, you have jewelry in your house. That's how precious it is. Um, to, do to do good deeds, it's like Dalai Lama. To do good deeds, I'm a good human being. Uh, uh, uh. I'm telling you what they told you. Uh, it's not, I'm not, not picking on anybody, okay? You need to understand that. I'm, not pick, I'm trying to tell you there's a problem. And they're amazing people, and you need to listen to them because they're giving you some good, and I'll tell you what that some good is. It's necessary. Take it. But there's a problem they're not going to be able to fix. You are going to fix that problem after today. Anybody else? Any, and, and as, uh, yes, sir. Yeah. What they forget to tell you is Islam is not about reading Quran and all that. It's a way of life. And you have to live it. And and the other problem that I see is in with Islam now, we are all into sabah. We wanna read the Arabic Quran, but we do not want to read the translation what God is actually trying to say. And this is the problem with the Mullah in The way of life that you want to live is not all about namaz and all that. It's how you want to live your life based on Quran with the help of God. I think, what's your name, sir? What's your name? Amir Sahib. Oh, Amir Sahib. They actually are very, some of them, not all of them, are very eloquent in describing the way of life. They are. They are. They're missing out on something else. I'll tell you, and I'll tell you why they're missing it out. Okay? And I'll tell you why some of them, which you named, a few people, they didn't miss out. Because there's, there's something that happened. And you're uh, old enough to understand that, and you're going to fix that problem for Rayans, okay? For yourselves and for your Nashabas. For your Aslams, for your Nashabas, and for your Rayans. You need to fix it. I'll tell you what that is. Okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
مسئلہ ہے اس وقت نہیں سیم سیم کی مسئلہ نہیں فارمیٹ فونٹ کا مسئلہ ہے اوکے دیر از لیٹ می جسٹ گیو یو لٹل اسٹوری اے لٹل ہسٹری اینڈ لیٹ می گونا کوئی ڈرن رائٹ ان ٹو دا پوائنٹ اوکے ان دا فرام دا ففٹین ہنڈریڈ ٹو دا ایٹین ہنڈریڈس یوروپینس پروڈیوسڈ فلاسفرس اینڈ فلاسفرس اینڈ فلاسفرس مسلمس پروڈیوس زیرو فلاسفرس ان دس فور ہنڈریڈ ایئرس اوکے مسلمس پروڈیوس اے لاٹ آف فلاسفرس بفور دیٹ اوکے غزالی از این امیزنگ ابن القیم ابن عربی فلاسفرس آل آل آف دیز فلاسفرس بٹ ان دس سکسٹین اینڈ سیونٹین ہنڈریڈ دا ایج آف فلاسفی کیم ان ٹو دا پلانٹ from Hume to Descartes to Kant to John Locke to, to Dostoevsky and you name it, you know, you, you look anywhere, you're going to be, you know, find a good, very avid, well-read thinker who can actually understand the problems of human beings and giving you solutions. I'm not just talking about Marx and, you know, I'm just talking about the general flavor of the planet changing to philosophy and ideology and solutions to the planet. But Muslims are not doing that. Why? Think about it. Just give me an answer. Why? It's a boring topic. I'm going to finish it right after this answer. Why did Muslims never produce a philosopher who is going to solve the bigger problems? I'll tell you, the general answer that everybody gives is, oh, Muslims were pushed out of philosophy and, you know, it's a haram sort of thing. It's mutashabihat sort of play and a lot of, you know, voodoo work goes into it. Everyone's going to come up with it. Yes, sir. No, no, we don't. That's exactly the... Uh, I'll tell you why. No, no. Yes, sir. The religion is allowed in the world. Who's they? The, the Muslim world. Muslim were loving uh, into the love of the world. No, no. Even they were loved. They, they love the world way more than Muslims. Bro. And that's why they come up with the solutions to the problem. If you don't love the world, you're not going to solve the problem of the world. Okay, let's not uh, drag this because this is not the point here. Muslims did not produce philosophers because Muslims had something else which philosophy was their European philosophy was trying to find okay Muslims already had that if you're not thirsty you're not going to look for a, wa- a glass of water okay you need to understand that and now Muslims are not carrying their glass of water anymore so Muslims need the philosophers that's why I'm looking at Rayan so carefully I need Muslims to become thinkers all of a sudden. All of a sudden, I need to, them to go into the bigger problems and bigger solutions of the planet. Because we don't have that one thing anymore. At the peak of European philosophy, Muslims were enjoying a good nap because they, were, they had the luxury to do that. They shouldn't have, but they had the luxury to do that. That's why Muslims never produced, let alone a good philosopher. We didn't even start the game we didn't we, we, we never entered the, the ring okay because two things happened to muslims number one ever since the prophet Islam, we never lost one thing which is the system of islam okay as long as um, if you were a muslim you were under a certain umbrella and that umbrella is going to try and solve you solve their problems for you And that umbrella is the system of Islam. Till 1924, Muslims, no matter what kind of plight that, that system was in, no matter what kind of crooks were running their system, but there was a system. And Europeans never had that system. At least not for, uh, you know, whatever nation that they used to call themselves at that time. The church, whatever they were doing, they came up with this philosophy of outsourcing all of their politics, their identity of, as, as a community which is called politics to bring everybody together to the you know, local governors, to the Caesar and take religion back to the church and the uh, church has nothing to do with whatever politics or whatever Caesar has to do or whatever prime ministers and presidents have to do about the affairs. So m- m- Christians didn't just divorce the church. Christians actually took to war against it because church was still calling the shots on so many of their social set, uh, setups. And the great war happened and Christians went to war against the church. Christians 
went to war using their philosophers, 30 years war, the biggest catastrophe ever in the history of mankind because of the number of deaths that happened in millions and millions and millions. Read about this. 30 years, Europeans killed each other just to annihilate the church. Okay? Now, Muslims did not have that problem. That's why we never went into that game. Muslims already had that philosophy. This is what I'm trying to tell you. In this ayah, Allah Ta'ala is saying, Allah is talking about himself that when we presented this whole purpose, when we said this is the ball game to every single thing that we created, Allah is saying, I presented it to all of you. No, one, we are just one of them. Insan is one. Everything else that Allah has created. Every one of them said, no, this is too much of a responsibility. Make sure you understand what Numan is going through, radiallahu anhu is going through. Make sure you understand what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is going through on the trip to Taif. Alone, single salute, all solvent. Okay, think about it. And now think about this. Think about when Aslam is sitting in that flight of Emirates or Itahad, I'm pretty sure they're both sitting in, coming to Perth or Melbourne or wherever they landed. Think about it. Nobody said, I'm not going to bear. Hamel means, you know, pregnancy. Everyone said, everything said, we're not going to carry this load. Sorry. We, we're not able to do that. And insan, the human being, comes up to Allah and says, Oh, well, I'm going to carry this. Give me this burden of taking care of everything. Everything. Every human being. But Marine said, you know what Marine said? And I said she was giving the right answer. Noman was giving, uh, showing responsibility of everybody. Not just everybody in the army. Everybody in the world. Literally everybody in the world. Literally, uh, Rayan, every Australian in Australia. Not just every Pakistani in Australia. Every Australian in Australia. This is what the job is. Yeah, that's the start of the job. Australia is not it. That's what we took yesterday. Yeah, Allah says, Inna hukana voluman jahula. Inna hukana voluman jahula means, Allah is saying, most of you guys didn't even know what you're saying. Do you know what this means? This means all of us were there. What's your name, ma'am? Rabia. Rabia, you and me were there. You know how you, I said you and me? You and me were there together, Rabia. At the same time. No, you saw me and I saw you. Listen to what I'm saying here. What's your name, sir? Zan was there, I was there, Zan saw me, I saw him. We all looked at Allah and said, I want to I wanna do this. We were together at that time. I'll tell you why I said you and I are together, Rabbi, you and I were together. Okay, whoever you're going to meet, whoever you're going to interact with, whoever you are going to connect with, no matter what, what level, becomes a man of your own age, your own age and your own time, and people of the same time were all coming together in clusters. And all of us, of all time, were all spent in front of Allah Azzawajal. Allah Azzawajal says, all of you guys came together. And at the, in that cluster, you and I were sitting, standing together. And may he live a very long life, because if he lives a long life, inshallah he will. Because he and I was all in the same, same cluster. Because kids, kids, they didn't say yes. Don't ask me how to put that math together, but kids didn't. But if they reached adulthood, yes, they did. Because that's the test. That's the test. That's why no kid is going to be asked questions if he dies as a child. No matter how he dies. Lucky. No questions asked. 
we we raising our hand in front of Allah Azza wa Jalla and said, yeah, you know what this is? We're going to take this up. Now, I'll tell you what the problem is. Torah, free. Talmud, free. Psalms, free. Injil, free of this ayah. Quran is the first book that says, you know what, I'll tell you the secret now. You keep blaming Allah Azza wa Jalla for putting you in this planet. In the Torah, in the Bible, in the Talmud, in the Injil, I'll tell you who did this. You did this. I didn't put it on you. You put it on yourself. Have you heard this auntie coming to you and says, and there's always an auntie, okay. and an uncle too, who says, uh, Have you met that auntie yet? Have you, are you that auntie? Have you met that uncle? Yes. Yet? Milli, na? Patani has my shak is I Allah. Har cheez has my shak. There is no punishment. You didn't get that simple? This is what the Quran, Quran just said. You took it upon yourself. There is no punishment unless the day of judgment happens. We are Muslims, we should know that. Everything else is a trial. Pain, trial. Happiness, trial. Not going into philosophy right now. Just telling you this, the, this is how simple it is. So when next time auntie comes, Fatma, Beta, punishment will be a trial. Hai. Auntie, Surah Azab. Okay? Surah Azab. So, coming to the general source, everybody clear? You and I asked for it. So don't blame no Shaba. You asked for camera up there. Okay? She didn't convince you. You asked the biggest problems. And camera is not your biggest problem. I'll tell you the biggest problem is. Rayan becoming an MP, fighting. For Israel is your bigger problem. And he's gonna, if you don't change anything about this. Because everyone, er, till now, Australia is the only ally with America which, which vetoes against every resolution 116 countries give every single time against the war crimes of Israel. Five people other than America, Australia, Luxembourg, Micronesia, Nicaragua. <laughs> you know who those little puppets are. They don't even know how to spell their own names. You know, Nicaragua and Micronesia and Luxembourg. They don't count. You know what they are? Those, those, those are three countries who enter the UN room where everyone's voting, like, what's going on? I don't even know what's going on, so we'll just sit with wherever the Americans are sitting. Because they're supposed to ask for tea and we're supposed to bring them a cup of tea. So, they don't even matter. Australia matters. Australia is not just any other country. And the problem is not Australia. The problem is you in Australia. The problem is you in Canberra. The problem is the problems of the world while you are in Canberra. The problem is you being an adult in Canberra while the problems were going on around the world. That's the bigger problem. That's what Allah is saying. You don't even know what you were asked for. Putting your hand in the cookie jar, you didn't even know what was. Going on? No, we told you when you said, oh, oh I'm going I'm to do it. Yes, sir. Upar ka, ya Allah, upar ka darja seven, number seven chai, fir dos. Not just you, I mean, I know, I was there. I'm not, you know, you have no idea. So these are all <coughs> conscious decisions. My uh, slide format does not work on this station, so it's going to be all black and white and no pictures, okay? We're going to send you the slide decks. It allowed all the funnels. Let me just explain to you where I was. All of this is covered, by the way. Yeah, so there are three kinds of Muslims that you're going to actually encounter. Uh, immigrants only, okay? 
In Pakistan, there are only two kind of Muslims, non-believing Muslims and people who think they're Muslims are not Muslims. <laughs> okay, so there is a believing Muslim and then there's a non-believing Muslim and uh, don't, don't focus on that. Let me not distract you. No, no, don't, don't, don't read. Look at me, look at me, it's all right. I need you to understand because without the diagrams it's going to be a little difficult, you're going to start reading it. Uh, anyone who's ever read uh, psychology at any level? No? Oh yeah, you are? Okay. So you understand what an existential crisis is. You don't have to be a psychology major to understand that. Every immigrant knows exist existential psychology, uh, crisis. Okay, especially girls, you know it way more because you feel you have a bigger spectrum of emotions. Okay, that's natural, that's medical, that's science. Okay, what's your name? Ramin. 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 Ramin, so how old are you? I'm 12. Ten? Oh, 12. I was thinking you're 10. So 12. Ramin, you're going to feel more, how you have brothers? You're going to feel more of the world than your brother, okay? Don't judge him. He's not dumb. Okay, we just don't have enough brain, which means we're dumb, by the way. We don't have enough brain. But he's got different intelligence, you've got different intelligence. Girls feel more. you got a true feeling of the world, okay? Boys don't, we don't. So what we do is, we ask. We ask the next guy, and he doesn't feel it today. So what we do is, we form a conclusion based on the number of people that we are actually talking to. You can actually get the true feeling, okay? So you're, you're born here. Oh, okay, Australia. Yeah, okay. So, your parents from? Pakistan. Okay. You're, you're her parent? Okay, so you're from? Pakistan. No, where? Islamabad. Oh, you're from Islamabad. Nice, okay. Nice to see you here. Yes, same here. The video is very good. Yeah, the video is Islamabad, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Gaon ki hai. Banta hai, na? Gaon ki hai, banta hai. Yeah, I'll tell you why. Mai kyun ye data nahi mila raho? That's part of my demand of psychology. Okay, I landed in Melbourne. Okay, I'll tell you what, 10th, 10th, maybe what, 9th, 10th. I got terrified the first day because of, uh, you know, the kind of flight I got. <laughs> Did not know, I, I, one of my teammates booked that flight, okay. And uh, as soon as I entered Melbourne, what's your name? Nasir. Nasir. The way I've been treated by Melbourne, my, my hosts, makes me believe that I, I cannot survive without them. You know, it's not just the desi culture, but it's the personalization of my hosts, taking care of little things, and so all that flight thing is washed away. And, you know, they're, I mean, everything, they're, they're taking care of everything, as much as, as they can, because I'm trying to run away from them, and they're trying to, chase. literally, I swear to God, I'm running, hiding, and they're chasing me, finding me, so that they can take care of me. That's what your own people do for you. That's called community. That's called a bond. Okay? That's what Fatima, you said, when an immigrant comes out, lives in a totally different land, he does not get that. He does not get, he requires that. It's not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's basic demand of human beings. So that everybody comes together and helps me wherever I'm down, whatever I'm suffering, I'm uh, let alone bleeding for whatever I'm going through. So if you don't get that, you feel less worthy. It's called less. Uh, it's called self-worth. If you have enough of self-worth pattern, all of a sudden the next stage comes. You know what that is? Zero or breaking or, or fracturing the self-esteem. Once your self-esteem breaks, you're a nobody. You are a who? You are a nobody. Forget Australians and accents and English and parliaments and is No, no, no. Your next door neighbor is going to step over you and you would want him to do that. Zero self-esteem people want the pain. They feel as if they're getting some attention. So they're worth something. Even if someone steps on my head or face, even that is something. That's low self-esteem. That's why Fatima, immigration, hijra is such a big thing because you start from zero self-esteem. 
Your father never tells you this. You know why? You're too young. He wants to protect you. He fights this battle every day to create his self-esteem. I swear to God, that's the toughest battle. Tougher than Gaza and you know, Israel. A battle of invisible, infinite, infinite variables going on. Color, creed, English, and grammar, and you know, money, and car, and house, and next door neighbor, his car, my family back home, my friends, my classmates, everything coming into comparison. There's a big guy, Broom, with a V. Read him up, okay? Your age, you should know that. He came up with this book. I teach that book. That's why. Where he came up with this weird phenomenon, which is now a quotient. It's called Broom's Quotients. How to measure the equity of a human being versus the equity of another human being. We compare that every single time. It's called the coefficient of input versus the outputs. Whatever I give as work and I get in return versus my colleague who gives whatever input and then he gets, if he gets more output with the same input, no matter what kind of output I'm getting, I'm still going to be demotivated. Okay? Not complicating this. What I'm saying is self-esteem, beta jab zero hoti hai. You have no idea. That is the lowest part of your, low, lowest point in your life. And zero self-esteem, man can never be a father. He can never be a mother. And you know what the problem is? He cannot be a husband and she cannot be a wife. That's why if you're new in Australia, I do not know Gab, but in 10 years, you're going to have extramarital problems. Most probably. Because Pakistanis and Indians don't get self-esteem developed inside their own countries because of whatever crooks that we're actually living with. And not just Imran Khan Nawaz Sharifs. I'm talking about your school teachers as well. I'm talking about your, you know, your regular Joes. Everyone's trying to you know, do whatever they can. And they hurt the fabric of the child's self-esteem. And as soon as he develops into some sort of a decision maker, he runs to countries like these. And as soon as he comes here, he's already suffering from low self-esteem. And this is a battlefield for the big and mighty. A low self-esteem guy is never going to win it. Never. So what he's going to do is, he's going to chase the goatees. You know why? And you know what those, what those women will be? Not his friends. Do you know who they're going to be? No point for guessing those kind of women. Only to satisfy his self-esteem. And the wives are going to do the same thing. And you're not going to expect from a desi woman disloyalty, extramarital affair, infidelity. You don't, you don't expect that. So it's going to be twice the shock. Twice the shock. You expect this from a desi man, any man. You're trained into thinking men are going to cheat on you. But we are trained into thinking even if women cheat on us, desi woman doesn't, Muslim woman doesn't. So that becomes such a bad, shocking, devastating event for us that we t do twice the reaction. That's the spiral. God forbid you're going to enter in the next 10 years. If you're newly immigrant, especially in Australia, if you have that sort of, you know, ST definition. So where are the symptoms and indicators? Regular. Regular indicators. I talk to boys. I'll tell you what the girls say. The boys say, sir, you know what, you Australia tour. Pe. Ki hifazat ki technique sir. <laughs> like really? Yeah, that's, that's what your bigger problem is? Sir, have you not been to Melbourne yet? Have you not been out? And I said, yeah, I've been out. I've enough seen enough creatures like you. Yeah. Do you know your wife and kids require a real man with high self-worth and self-esteem who's going to call the shots, whose bigger achievement is not That's his bigger achievement? That's it? That's, a, that's your epitome of life? Imagine how low our self-esteem would be that this is some achievement level in your, in your matrix. So don't read everything here. Just 
try and understand what's going on out there, okay? So, your first generation immigrant is self-motivated, very self-motivated. It takes a lot of work to come out of Pakistan. Not paperwork, mental work. Paperwork to hota hai. Mental work, decision, convincing. Well, no, no, not convincing. Everyone wants you to come out. But he's super motivated. And then all of a sudden, he comes into this sort of country, and first thing he loses is his identity. Why? Because that's why I said, apne dara clerics ke naam batayin. Because you rightly pointed out, sir, all the people that you're going to go through, Islam ki core jo hamari identity hai, the thing that we actually cherish the most, no matter what you take off, take my clothes off, take my skin off, cannot take Islam off. We all have that in common. Take my passport off, yeah. Take my kids away. Don't take my Islam away. That's what we are. And you know what the problem is? That's the first thing anyone's going to take away. You know why? Because we have not centralized the function, function of Islam, the purpose of Islam. And if you do not know the purpose of being in any company, how are you going to remain in that company? Whatever job that you do, if you don't know the purpose of the company and your purpose in the company, then how are you measuring the worth of your own self in that company? Think about it. What kind of contribution are you doing in that company if you don't even know what the company does or what you have to do for that company? That's something that mainstream Islam misses. I'll tell you why. Because we were influenced in the 1700s, 1800s, when Muslims were losing their system, their whole political system in 1924 fell down on its face and Winston Churchill did not just draw lines on the map, he draw, drew lines inside our minds as well. Okay? That's the problem most clerics are not solving. That's the problem most Muslim speakers are not telling you because they're taking that literature of what to do in Islam from the time when Islam was already an established system in the world. So they're going to quote you all the big names, you know, literally from Ibn Qasir to Ibn Al-Qayyim, from Ibn Arabi to Ibn Hasham. Every hadith, every ayah, everything, and then the reference of the Tabaeens and Taba Tabaeens and, you know, till 200 years ago. But they keep forgetting that at that time, Muslims were not dying to go to Canberra in Miami. Muslims were inside a central system when they were writing all of these books. Muslims never suffered from that problem of exist existential crisis. Never! Now, Muslims can't even, for example, Australian dollar is clinged up with an index with the US dollar. You know, everybody knows that? So is the Pakistani rupee, right? So is the Japanese yen. What is that index? You know the index, right? You know that there's a measuring instrument. An American president can't just say, you know what, today the dollar is, should be about 500 Australians. You cannot do that. There's a certain system, okay? There's a regulation of how currency moves up and down. Is this against the gold? Yeah, the bullion. Yeah, yeah. This is against the gold, but not just against the gold. There's a lot of other variables now. We cannot go in that detail, but yeah, it's primarily gold, yeah. But gold remains the same. There's so many things that keep on changing. For example, now, you know, after Russia, Ukraine, there's going to be a lot more. But, you know, there's so much that goes on because of the kind of uh, resources you already have. It's called reserves. So, amongst other things. There's an index, there's a process. Just like that, a Muslim worth, Muslim worth, can only be measured if there's a central capital index. And there was. That's why America used to pay tax to who? To Muslims just to live in the seas, trade in the seas of the world, of the planet. Benjamin Franklin used to pay tax to the Muslim empire so that we can trade in our 
the, uh, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean Sea. That's a standard practice of, you know, the empire. If you want to come across anything that, are, that is, you know, around our airspace, you got to pay tax for it. It's simple. It's that simple. And that's why most Pakistanis don't know that. Most Pakistanis are Muslims because some non-Muslim man tried to rape some non-Muslim woman and that non-Muslim woman, in Karachi by the way, that non-Muslim woman said, you know what, there's only one system that has the value and worth of a woman, I'm going to write a letter to that guy and he's not going to let you go because this is a crime in his books. In Karachi there was no system, nobody knew Islam in that system, so she wrote a letter that was a ship. They were traveling in a ship. She wrote a letter and she gave it to the guy in the ship that, who is going to take this letter to the worst man in the history of Muslims, which is Hajjah bin Yusuf, but still running a system of Islam, which is going to measure my worth, because I'm a Muslim woman. And all of a sudden, this ship, this one guy, just runs away with the letter, takes it to Hajjah bin Yusuf, and... He says, a Muslim woman was touched and he sends the army and all of us now are Muslims. To protect a woman, we are 300 million Muslims now. To protect a woman, we are all 300 million Muslims. That's the value of a Muslim. And of all the people, the most insecure woman is Pakistani woman now. She's afraid of not non-Muslim. She's afraid of the most Muslims in Pakistan. She can't cross the street. And that's why you feel relieved in camera. There's no Pakistani staring at me. Ask your mother as a woman how it is to live in Islamabad. She'll be like, it's like... Closer people have microscopes and farther off people have telescopes. <laughs> as soon as she ent out, takes her first step outside the house, everyone in Islamabad storms right in. She turns the street, everybody's like, okay, over to you guys, over to you, next street. And the next street guys just look at her. <laughs> That's her life every single day. I ask girls in Canada, America, and wherever, like, what's the difference between Pakistan, India, and this... Nobody stares here. Nobody stares. Nobody stares. That's like your achievement. Itri tangai mi thi or temse. That after many years of Canada, America, Scandinavia, Denmark, if I have to say, what happened? Good or bad decision? Good decision. Why? Nobody stares here. We stare them like Guantanamo Bay. These are the two jail cells that we had put them into. Tear them right into out, right outside of Pakistan or India. I mean, you're going through hell in, you know, social, more, uh, economical, or whatever, financial, whatever. But you're like, thank God I'm not in Muslim country anymore. <laughs> Muslim country of oh, Muslim men. What's your name, sir? Uh, yeah. Ismail. Ismail. Yes. Ismail. Yes, Ismail. Ismail. Yeah, Ismail, yeah. So where are you from? Um, in Dubai. In Dubai? Yeah. Oh, like where in Dubai? No. Right. Before that. Um, I was born there and raised there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? About the girls? Uh, not you, you don't know when people stare at girls? No? Okay. Good enough. I'm not going to give you ideas. <laughs> so, good. Stay like this. Girls are not afraid of being stared at by men. Good. Awesome. Good life. Okay. So, two different clerics. Hold on to those. I want you to let go of some parts of one cleric. Don't let go of any of these clerics. Even if it is Mufti Mehen or you know, uh, Yasser Qazir. Awesome learning, take, make sure, make sure, do not divorce the man, okay? Do not divorce the man by just thinking, oh, you know, his philosophy is not complete. Oh, it doesn't matter. 
He's telling you whatever he's telling you is usable, awesome, at so many levels, I'll tell you what those levels are. But let's construct the, the diagram first. Where's the problem? The problem is, if you're taking the literature from the time when Muslims are already in a center, in a station, in a system, and now that we're not, those things will become, what, what was the thing that you called, sir? Uh, way of life, rituals, and what's that word? Uh, uh, let me just show you. Uh, a bigger part, uh, a placebo part of the belief system, okay? Here you go. The values, the behavior, and the rituals. That's all we're getting for Muslim scholarship right now. The values, yeah, they give you values. They give you behaviors, how to behave, and then they give you rituals. Three Eids in Australia, first country to have three Eids. Rituals, these are rituals. These are events in Islam. You should not have three Eids. Come on, be a regular Muslim, have two Eids. Okay? Two choti eats, two bari eats. Don't have three choti eats, three bari eats. That's kind of weird, okay? Even for Muslims. So, what happens? What happens is because as soon as because uh, most of the Muslims don't read the Quran and Sira and uh, Hadith, whatever I'm going to tell you, you're naturally going to think, oh, you know what? He's talking about Islam, so he might know more about it than me. So, whatever he's going to say is going to be right and I'm going to take it. So, what this is going to happen is your current clerics are going to become catalysts to the already fractured psychology that you already have. That's why if there is no Apple, the company, or Microsoft, there is no worth of any employee who is working for Apple or Microsoft. That's what's going on right now. You take away the system and you remain intact all the teachings of Islam, those teachings will seem right, but they're not worth anything. Okay? Just like that, the policy and process, the code of conduct of any company is awesome. But that company, if it remains no more, on paper that code of conduct is amazing code of conduct, but it's not worth anything. Just like that, you took out the, the, the system of Islam, but you let the literature of Islam remain and then you keep pumping values, behaviors and rituals. Yeah, yeah, they are rituals. They are values. They are all good looking. They make a lot of sense, but they're not going to save us from any problem. They're not going to make us measure any worth or any contribution I'm supposed to do. We can't even do the, the zakat properly. That's why we can't even run the zakat calculators properly. Because the cause is run as a central system. Human, individual Muslims are not supposed to run the card themselves and try and do math. The central system does the zakat. I know I have done it. A partner of mine, my, my mentor, my teacher, is about to launch this app about how to run a central zakat system. Take it, run it yourselves, combine together. No Muslim, not even a single Muslim, will go hungry or be under the line of poverty if that central system of zakat comes into play today with the number of Muslims and the value of uh, Muslims that is uh, the worth, uh, what's the word, the affluence of Muslims, that the money that we already have as Muslims. We don't even need anybody else's money. I'm just telling you just one indicator, which is the zakat, which is the money, the circulation of money, which is the system of how we run uh, the economics for the poor. Now, I'll tell you why I'm telling you this. If there is no central system, there is no way to measure zakat for everybody. Because then everyone will have to do it on his own. And that's why you get questions like, oh sir, I must make a salary after every month. How am I supposed to pay zakat? I got this and that going on. I don't have any stagnant income. How am I supposed to pay zakat? And every cleric comes up with a new answer. That's why different types of problems, which are not even supposed to be there, have different types of fatwa. And the one thing that is most famous from Australia is, outside Australia, by the way, I did not know that before I came here. I mean, I knew that way before I came here, sorry. I did not know it after I came here. Not, locals didn't tell me. I knew about Australians, Muslims, that 
anybody can get any kind of fatwa, it does not, no problem. An imam is going to be there to service you. Contradictory fatwa? Yeah, awesome. So every flavor of fatwa is available in Australia. It's like, that's not even possible because you guys are what, 800,000, maybe a half, close, close to a million Muslims all together in Australia. There cannot be that kind of dissonance already, but there is. You're not at that old in Australia, but there is that kind of dissonance. Maybe that is why. So this is the fracture and these are the, that's the, the what is the cause? Anybody? I'm just going to revise it one more, one last time. What's the cause? Most of the definitions of Islam that you are getting are only for rituals, values and behaviors. Why? Because the literature that you are using is from the prime of Islam, but they've taken the prime out. Now, Pakistan is not an Islamic country. We cannot say, you know what, you know, this literature, Pakistan, everybody starts to tell the truth. All of a sudden, Sharia is going to come up. No, it's not going to happen like this. If everybody pays, pays, pays zakat, if everybody pays, you know, their taxes or whatever, things are going to get better. No, it's not going to happen like this. There's a very bigger thing that you're missing out on. But I'm not here to teach you that. I'm here to tell you that how to actually place yourself and understand the fracture. So, you and I, our mommies and daddies, did the same thing. My mother told me what Islam is. You know what she told me? Paruk pella kalma tayyab. Tayyab mane paak. And that's how Islam is being trained in Pakistani households. Your mommy did this, my mommy, my mommy did this. My father also told me, this is right or this is wrong. <laughs> Mostly who is right or who is wrong rather than this is right or this is wrong. And we never got that question. We didn't even ask that question, nor did we get an answer. Oh, what is it for? All of this Islam and being Muslim, what is this for? What is the purpose of all of this? That's where I put you, that eye in front of you. That's the cause. This is the two. Look at this. These are the two psychologies, the philosophies. The philosophy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I'll tell you how to look into it and it'll prove it on its own. And the philosophy of all of us. <laughs> all of us combined and, 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 and as individuals. And all the indicators I'll show you. Let's just take our philosophy. Fastest growing religion in the world is? Are you sure? Okay. Every big celebrity is coming into Islam. Regular people coming into Islam. Who is converting them? People like us. So people like us are converting people into Islam. Non-Muslims are throwing away the luxuries and coming to Islam looking at a guy like me. Okay. It's awesome. So what the code Umar Khattab couldn't crack, I cracked. He, Sahabas couldn't crack the code, I cracked it. You cracked it. Zakir Naik cracked it. Indians cracked it and you know, Indonesians cracked it. Okay, I believe you. I, till now I believe you. Omar Suleiman, most beloved man in Muslim community in America. So is so many else. I'm just giving you a name because that name stuck into my mind. Because when he went into the LGBT parade to support them, everybody comes in and then you know what? It's a win-win for everybody. And it's a peace. Islam is peace and he gave the message of peace. And just like that, a lot of things were said and done by, by, about Charlie Hebdo. And we know who all of these people who do, Muslims who do that. So Muslims actually are giving a very good picture, very good picture of whatever we can actually do our best as marketeers, they say it, marketeers of Islam and people come into Islam. I'm just talking about one thing here because I'm going to go through the deep, this is only two layer process, two story building. I'm going to go to the basement right after this. Now look at the Prophet Sallallahu pro uh, Islam. As soon as he presents Islam, everybody hates it, okay? Hates it so much that they try to kill him. 
which of our version of Islam is going to make our lives difficult? No, actually, we're the fastest growing religion in Islam in the world. He becomes thrown away by his own family. Own family. Okay? So that means something else was going on at that time. He was presenting in a totally different flavor. We're presenting a totally different flavor. We could both be right. Of course, he is right, Sallallahu We could be giving his own philosophy as well. Let's test that out in basement level now. Go a little lower. This is what happens. And I'm not talking about uh, what philosophy you should have. I'm talking about the need of a philosophy and what's the difference uh, of uh, not having one. Current philosophers, all of us, all of the Muslims take the philosophy from established Islamic system. You know what that philosophy was? That now the system is established, now work on yourself and grow into it so that you can sustain these kind of systems. You have to be an able man and a woman. Your nafs should be as clean as an angel because the system has to be sustained. Somebody, whoever, put the system intact and now you got to carry it forward. Now, this is the math. The teaching is the same, but the system is no more. So everyone, every Muslim is going to teach you this. What is the purpose of Islam? The nafs has to be clean as, a, as an angel. Why? Well, nobody asked the purpose question. Otherwise, the purpose question was there. So that you can sustain the system of Islam. You understand me? So that's why most of the Muslims are not going to answer this question. Why should I be cleansing and doing tazkiyah on my nafs? Why? What's the purpose of this? And you know what they're going to say? Because that's why Allah made us. Allah Ta'ala says, I only made jinns and insan so that they can do ibadah. And this is what's going on. If that were the case, then the finest way to do ibadah was to leave Makkah and never come back. Do not pick up, you know, do anything. Take Ali and Khatija and run. You know what I'm saying? What he did was, he did, Sallallahu he did the exact opposite. He said, no, listen, we're going to make sure that all of the system of Islam is implemented everywhere that we can. And if I am going to start this movement, and even if I don't finish it, the last entry, the second entry of Isa ibn Maryam is going to secure it. Every house has to have Islam as a message entering there. This is the system. That's the culmination of the whole ball game. Which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa starts and Isa ibn Maryam comes back and completes. Everyone has to be under the, the system of Islam. Okay, I get that. Why? What's the purpose? The purpose is simple. If you need to raise the acumen of an individual, the worth of an individual, the self-esteem of an individual. You need a regulation index, the system, because if it is not a global system, it is not going to get you that kind of self-esteem. Simple. So, Australia has uh, that uh, athletics. Australia has athletics. Obviously, it has athletics. Okay. If you were anybody, just raise your hand. I just want to talk to you. Or just yes, yeah, sir. What's your name? Jafar. Jafar with an ayin, right? Jafar. Okay. I was just about to quote a story from Jafar uh, Ibn Tayyar, but immigrant to Habsha. So, Jafar, you want to train for uh, athletics to compete for Australia, okay? You got to do some certain training, right? That's, listen to me. If you want to work on your, your, your nafs and you clean yourself and be honest and, you know, peace loving and what's the word? Good human being and and respectful and all the values and all the virtues and all those attributes and all of that. Then you got to have that sort of a backing from a purpose. That's what I'm saying. That's what he's missing. Why? So, Jafar is preparing for Australian athletics. Give me another, uh, so what's your name? The USA t-shirt, yeah, the boy. Yeah. What's your name? Shamil. How do you spell that? S H A M E O. Shamil. Awesome. Shamil. Nice pronunciation, man. You good? <laughs> Shamil. 
Jafar and Shamil. So Jafar is preparing for Australian, right? And Shamil is preparing for the Olympics. Same, track and field. Track and field, okay, both. You know what track and field is, right? Okay, 100 meter sprint, okay? Australia, Olympics. Tell me in one year they're gonna compete. Who is gonna be a better athlete? Shamil? Boy. Because you heard Shamil. He's competing for the Olympics and Jaffer is competing for the Australian National Games. Who's going to be a better athlete? Girls! How come boys are so clear about common sense questions? <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Girls? Yes, ma'am. No, no, the girls are just, just about to cry. Yeah. Yeah, what's going on? Why is it so sad? Jaffa and Shamil, come on, think about it. Okay, simple. Australian athletics versus the Olympics. What requires a better athlete? You know the Olympics, right? The five ring thing to everyone in the world? Yeah. I thought that was an easier question, eh? I don't know, I need a girl to answer this. Olympics, what do you know? Olympics, what do you Seriously? Olympics, like, puri dunia hai kathi hoti hai. Lai karte hai dousre se. Woh ek mashal leki data hai, shuru mein, phaat paanch saal baad. Olympics? Nahi? Nahi suna kabhi lafz? Koi vandok do mujhe. Suna hua hai. Suna hi hua hai, Olympics. Yeh nahi pata kya hoada, suna hua hai. Jaisa Nobel Prize suna hua hai. Islam suna hua hai. Yes, sir. Jafar, be a little louder. I want every girl to listen to this. Uh -huh. Level. That's exactly what my question is. Where's the difference in the level? So Olympics, everyone in the human planet is competing. And in Australia, only human beings in Australia are competing. Okay? You're obviously going to have a totally different level. That's why Australia does not win all the gold medals, right? Yeah, no, no, it's not about, because Australia means a lot, many, okay, you have to understand. Give credit where credit is due. But the world is competing with you. So Shamio is naturally going to be 10 times the athlete because he's competing with at a totally different level. He's competing against everything. That's the global level athlete we're preparing here, okay? So I'm not saying you're going to be a bad athlete. What I'm saying is you cannot compete. You cannot compete, I'm sorry. It's Mercedes versus Kia. Okay. You cannot compete. It's Apple versus any other computer. Well, not any other, but local, locally made, locally sold computers. Okay? So, Olympics are in here, athletics. Okay? No, you don't know. Come on, it's the right. First step is to say, I do not know. It's okay. Olympics, they run away from the Olympics, so they win. Girls, seriously. That's why, you know what, that's why they th generally think they see ladki dumb with That's what they're thinking, I swear. You know what, they don't say it. We don't, we don't say it. You know what we do? We don't expect it. We don't say it. We're like, And you know what, what was the question? Do you want to marry the other side? Do you We we, why, why don't we tell the truth, man? We naturally think that the Desi girl is dumb. Why don't we say it? Not dumb like absolutely dumb, dumber than the man. You know, because you know what? Asal mein nahi aap log dumb. But, no, no, well, asal mein nahi aap dumb. I know the science. I know the science. You're not dumber than the man. I know that, I know some of my friends are so dumb, you have no idea. They're boys. They're like dumber than dinosaurs. They should be extinct. But you girls are not giving enough samples of intelligence, I'm telling you, I swear. Especially little girls. No, 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 you can't. Keep, keep looking at me. I know you're looking, yeah. Come up with some examples we need. You know who needs it? My daughter needs it. We need heroes from girls. You know what? They can, gold roti, 
آپ نے تو وہ بھی چھوڑ دیا آگے کون مجھے کہا تھا پراٹھے بھی نہیں بنتے اب تو پاکستان میں نو آئی ایم سیڈ ایم ناٹ آئی ایم ناٹ جسٹ ڈس اپوائنٹیڈ بیکاز آئی نو اللہ نے نہیں ایسے بنایا ہوا گاڈ از گیون ایکلی نو آر گرلس برین از بگر دین دا بوائز برین یو نو دا رائٹ نو یو ڈین نو دیٹ بیکاز یو نو نو دیز تھنگس دس از اے ٹروتھ بائی دا وے یور سیم سائز آف مین یور برین از گن بی بگر دین ہیز سیم ہائٹ سیم فیٹ کانٹ اینڈ سو گاڈ گیو یو بگر برین بٹ یو ڈین یوز اٹ ایکسیپٹ آن تھنگس وچ یو نو یو بٹ یو یوز اٹ So, Jafar is naturally going to lose. Shamil is naturally going to win. Give him a year. Why? Because he's competing at a different level. It's a bigger global level. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. These people put the man in the center. And they say, you know what? All you got to do is just be a good athlete, man. Even though, you know what Islam was saying? Every man. You're responsible for every man. Put a system in. Every man. Play the Olympics. Every prophet played the Olympics in that term, of course. Everybody under the leadership. That's why Marine, when you said Noman, he was taking care of everybody. And I said, everybody who? And you said the army. I was like, are you kidding me? Everyone in the world. Whatever you're going to do, Shamil, every boy is going to reap the benefits if you do the good thing. And if you do something wrong, every boy is going to find an excuse. If he can do it, I should do it too. That's the responsibility of all Muslims. But we don't, you know what we do? As if, as if we are going to live under a fig tree and go into this yogi pun and then you're like, you know what? Me and my God connected and that's it. And that's the kind of Islam that we, we've been given. That's why there's no index. That's why there's no measure. And that's why no matter how good or bad you are as a Muslim, you will never be able to know. That's why lack of self-belief. That's it. You want self-esteem? You need an index. You want self-belief? Sorry, you need a system. How are you going to measure the value of the dollar if you do not have a system that regulates the dollar or any other currency? That's how simple mechanisms are. That's why Ali bin Abi Talib and Abu, Abu, uh, Amr Khattab and Abu Bakr Siddiq were measured. Abu, Amr, and I, said, I went to the Prophet ﷺ and said, am I higher in rank than uh, Abu Bakr? The Prophet ﷺ used to look at a person like this. Whenever anybody asked a question, Prophet ﷺ gave both of his shoulders and both of his eyes to him. That's the phrase in Arabic. Both of his shoulders and both of his eyes means, you talk to me, and all of a sudden, even if I'm looking like this, if you say anything, I'm going to give you all of me. And the Prophet ﷺ used to give all of his attention to the person. Amr bin al says, That when the Prophet ﷺ used to do that, the regular person used to think he's very, very important. Because the Prophet ﷺ is directly looking into me now with both of his shoulders, both of his eyes. So he says, I got a little ahead of myself when Prophet ﷺ started talking to me. So I said, maybe I should ask. I said, uh, <clears> O <throat> oh, Rasulullah, Do you think I'm a little on the rank as close to Abu Bakr Siddiq or even higher? But Prophet was anything but someone who's not going to tell the exact bitter truth even if you like it or not. So Prophet says, he says, our Allah says that Prophet without any takallaf says, Allah, no, Abu Bakr Siddiq is way higher in rank. And then he says, then I was like, okay, okay. I'm still that important because he looks at me. So I feel it. I feel it. I'm going to ask if Umar, Umar Khattab, because he was a big enemy of Islam, like I was before Islam. So am I bigger than, uh, higher than Umar Khattab? And the Prophet says, Blah. no, you're not. He's way higher than rank. And then he says, so Usman? And Prophet says, no. And then our bin Allah writes himself, okay? It's a Muslim hadith, a very long hadith, very amusing hadith of Amr al Allah. He says, then instead of asking for the fourth person, I kind of notice that maybe I'm going to let all of the Arab pass in front of me <laughs> without getting my name in. Because now he's losing self-worth. You understand me? That's the difference between self-worth and self-esteem. Self-esteem, no comparison. 
self worth comparison equity versus equity that's psychology that's classic psychology 101 that's exactly what i mean our self esteem is shattered when we come out of pakistan self worth can be made from anywhere i could be a great cricketer and an amazingly terrible man and still have self worth okay you know what i can bowl faster than anybody but if i have shattered self esteem I cannot have any relationship, any reliability, any dependability, any leadership, any self-confidence. That's the, 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 the debris that we're all under. That's why I'm saying, who's going to salvage that? You and I cannot salvage that individually. We can only salvage that unless we come together. That's why I'm saying this awakening tour is going to bring everybody together. I'm going to give you for your kids, inshallah, concepts for you, especially little, like between 12 and 18, 24. I'm going to tell you what to do if this and that happens. Make sure you understand how to re-establish your self-esteem, self-worth, self-confidence, most of all self-image, so that you can be a benefactor to your fellow Muslim, because my job is not to create a system of Islam. I cannot do that alone. My job is to connect all the Muslims for the sake of connect, for the creating the system of Islam. Because if there is no, not single system of Islam, then I'm sorry, my self-esteem is zero. My self-worth is zero. Because any other American, Aussie, Kiwi, Indian, African, Norwegian, Japanese, Chinese, it's going to come and across my, my eyes, my eyesight, and my self-image is going to shatter. Because I am nothing in the global index compared to what this guy. And that's what's going on in front of every human being that you guys are facing. I am uh, talking through all of these slides so you don't have to worry about it. This is the fracture I'm talking about. I need you to understand this quote from Noam Chomsky. You know who Noam Chomsky is? Read this. Noam Chomsky, I'm, he's not a Muslim. He's not a Muslim. He's not a Jew, okay? He's not a Jew. But he says, ASD in philosophy is more of a problem in the world than ASD. You know what the autism, autism is ASD. Autism, you know what autism is, okay? Forget the spectrum. I don't want to go into complication. The spectrum means there are different levels of autism. But ASD means generally the autistic mind. Autism in philosophy is more of a problem in the world than autism in neurology. Autism in neurology is autism. Okay? That's a disease. This guy is saying that in philosophy, like Muslims have two different philosophies now. One, a systematic, and one, the other one, systematic. One has to have a system. The purpose of a Muslim and purpose of Islam is to establish the rule of Allah Azzawajal all over. Okay? Let non-Muslims be non-Muslims. But Muslims are supposed to be worth against the system, measured against the system. So, he says, the autism of philosophy, and now keep in mind the Muslims right now, okay? The autism of Muslim philosophy is more of a problem in the Muslim world than the autism, the bimari, the, the disease. Causing everyone to lose their identity and reliability because self-esteem makes you liable, makes you liable. With anything right or wrong, your basic morality cannot be intact if you're not carrying your self-esteem. That's why we are so easily manip uh, manip uh, manipulatable, okay? Every desi man and woman can be, can be manipulated so easily. Compromise, threshold, barrier of entry is so low. Sometimes even for money. Well, most of the time, even for money. But sometimes, even for just money, you can betray any of the values that you're carrying. That's called corruption, right? That's for, if you take money and do break a value, that's called corruption. So that's what he's saying, that if you have autistic philosophy, that's worse than you have autistic psychology. And that's what I'm saying right now in front of the camera, in cameras, standing in Australia, that most immigrants, are philosophically autistic. No matter whether you're Muslim or you're not, you gotta come out of this autism 
and come into your philosophy so that you're philosophically identifiable. And if you're philosoph philosophically identifiable as a Muslim, then I gotta be able to measure you. What kind of a, how much of a Muslim are you, man? Have you ever asked this question to anyone? How much of a Muslim are you? You know what the answer is? Oh, I pray five times a day. That's how much of a Muslim? I'll tell you an uh, example. I'm just going to quote you an example. There's a big study. I'm going to finish with this, and I'm going to take your question. Uh, doctors overseas. Uh, I don't trust uh, Imran Khan's stats, but he did quote, uh, his, his, his administration quoted that more than 12 billion rupees, uh, or maybe dollars, he was quoting, are coming from overseas Pakistanis to Pakistan. See, when there's a system of measurement, you can actually measure the contribution. Allah Ta'ala says, get all the money in. So if there was a system, economically speaking, I could exactly know, and I have done the calculation, that's what we're going to release, inshallah, in Perth, if, if time allows us. Of, there are three major indicators. One is the big economic indicator, the financial. You can know how much of a Muslim you are if there is a system and you're contributing to that system. That's very simple math. So we can know that, for example, APNA doctors are about half a million dollars a year. There are 12,000 registered Muslim doctors in APNA. So you know what that means? 12,000 means half a million, 6,000 million dollars. Which means 6 billion, 600 billion. That's, that can shake any and every system, right? Even if they do 10% of it. You know, I'm giving you an example. Make sure you understand what I'm trying to do here. I'm giving you the measure. If there is no system, you're, you're worth zero as a Muslim. But if you have a system, you can have a worth, even measured in terms of money. Now, I gave you this example so that you can understand. Just like APNA, the doctors, there's another organization. I need you to Google that up today. You should have known by, that. Nah, uh, by now. Israel is measuring the worth of every Jew through every penny, every Jew is contributing towards the system of Judaic philosophy installed by Theodor Herzl in Tel Aviv, which is called Israel. So their system, their system called Israel, is actually measuring the worth of every Jew who is, I swear to God, contributing to all these three things, primarily money, which is the Quran's order, that if you are not going to become this one system, this one nation, and contribute whatever you have, and become one organism, then you are the cancer to that organism. Okay? This is what Allah is, Allah is saying. Let me just... This, this, is, uh, this is Israel. This is the model of Israel. That's what I'm saying. That they are the Jews of the Quran. And I'm asking you that overseas Pakistanis, overseas Muslims are the biggest hope for me. Local Pakistanis cannot even dream of what I'm saying right now. They can't even comprehend what I'm saying right now. They think I'm a kook. And living example of Israel is right in front of them. So, here Allah Ta'ala says, in Allah, la yughayyiru. The key word is, ma bi qawm. If you're not coming together as one nation, one system, okay? If you're not treating each other as one system, one people, then in there as individuals, you're nobody. You're nobody. You're not very, uh, worth zero. No, no. Zero is a number. You're nobody. And if you come in inside a system, connect with each other, then work towards a single purpose, then you become a system. And it has, first and foremost, financial demand upon you. And that's what wa'iddu lahum mastatatu means. And that's exactly what Allah is saying, that okay, if you are not going to behave like a system, behave like people, a single organism, all of you, then I'm not going to help you. That's why I've said no prayer of many Muslim is going to be answered. Jitni marzi duayen kar le, me urdu me bata raha hoon jaan ke taake aapke emotional had nas pe lagge jaake. 
خواتین کوئی دعائیں قبول نہیں ہونی آپ کی یہ اللہ تعالیٰ نے یہاں پہ بتا دیا ہوا ہے اس لیے نہیں ہوئی آج تک کوئی دعائیں قبول مانگ کے دیکھیں رو کے جائے نمازوں پہ کئی کئی ہزار تصویات کی منتیں مانگ کے دیکھیں دعائیں قبول نہیں ہونی رول از سمپل کہ اللہ نے اس قوم کی حالت کبھی نہیں بدلنی جس نے خود اپنی حالت نہ بدلنی ہو دس از دس از دس از سور راج گوگل از اپ سور راج دس از نا دا ٹرانسلیشن دس از نا دا ٹرانسلیشن ٹرانسلیشن یو شڈ گوگل اپ دس وار ایم جسٹ سینگ اقبال نے شعر لکھا تھا نا وٹ از اقبال شعر خدا نے آج تک اس قوم کی حالت نہیں بدلی نہ ہو جس کو خیال خود اپنی حالت کے بدلنے کا دس از دا ٹرانسلیشن آف دس آیا اقبال جس روڈ ان پوئٹری Does this say that if a man does not fix himself and his nafs and tazkiyah, Allah is not going to help him? No. It says Allah only helps when you come together and behave the way I made a purpose for Islam to be. Inna dina inda lahil Islam. Allah only has Islam. Islam is not an individualistic matter. If it were, Prophet ﷺ would have been in different jungles and different isolated deserts. But no, he came in, he brought in everybody together, established a system, and we reaped the fruit of that system for a while, till 1924. After that, every cleric, every speaker, every teacher, every school teacher, every Hafiz al-Quran, every, every muallam, every sheikh, every sheikha, better start getting their act together that every Muslim has to come together, otherwise no Muslim is going to survive. And by the way, this is not just my theory, this is a practical example of what the Judaic philosophers did. And you know what the foremost duty of every Jew is? When is the third temple going to be made? There is a simple condition, third temple will never be made until, and they have What is, fill in the blanks. Until what? Till every Jew enters the land of Israel. That's how simple third temple is. So they have a physical, geographical map of getting everybody together. But they're only chote se number. They're tiny little number, so they can do that. All Muslims can't even fit in Israel, even if they wanted to. We can't even fit in Pakistan or Bangladesh or wherever. So, Muslim, that's their philosophy. That's not my philosophy. But my philosophy is don't go to Israel or wherever. But Maaz bin Jabal, when he was going to Yemen by the Prophet ﷺ, he was sending him to Yemen. Maaz bin Jabal realized through the words of the Prophet ﷺ that the Prophet ﷺ is not going to be here next year. And they both were crying, by the way. Both were crying. The Prophet ﷺ is, uh, you know, going... Sending him to Yemen and he's just, you know, bidding him fare, farewell and goodbye. And Mahal bin Jabal says, what if, uh, what if I uh, die and uh, I cannot be with you? Or what if I'm physically not close to you and, you know, either one of us dies? And the person says, you don't have to be with me or close to me physically. Wherever you are, unless and as long as you're connected with me, connected with me, through your, you know, whatever deeds that you're doing, whatever the purpose that you're trying to suffice for, It doesn't matter whether, whether you are in Israel or not. We are not Jews. We don't have to be in Mecca to be Muslims. Wherever we are, we have to be connected as one and run as one and perform as one. Unless we get connected, this is not going to come true. And if it's not going to come true, no individual Muslim. Anything is going to come. Oh, divine help is coming. No, everyone is going to say that. No, I don't see the only Allah coming in. The winds of Allah's help, sorry, they're, they're not going to come in for me. Because I'm just a man. I'm just a man, I'm sorry. I need the system to back me up. The funnel gets connected and everything, every good comes to me. That's how simple it is. Are you not sad? That a guy of my age has the guts to say that no prayer of you is going to be answered? 
Are you not your mind creating a challenge? How dare you say that to me, man? It is between me and my God. Is he going to depend on what you have to think about Islam? No, I'll tell you what the Quran says and I'll tell you the seerah and you do the math. And then you know what? Even if you don't want to do the math, just do the math on the last 20 times that your prayers were answered. Okay, you know what? 10. You know what? 5. Okay, you know what? Since I'm in Canberra, the last two times your prayers were actually answered. In a row. Literally. And you think it's a small matter? That's all we have. Allah, dua. What else do we think we have? Or koi asset hai mare pas? Dua se bada koi asset hai mare Read the hadith. I'm giving you a homework. Ali bin Abi Talib. The sahabi goes and says, my prayers are not getting answered. And he says, you cannot be alone. Read the hadith. And he says, what, what do you mean I cannot be alone? It's like, there must be more of you. Go ask around. There must be more of you. Make a group and come back to me. And then the next day he says, yeah, there are a lot like me. Who are prayers are not answered. And Ali bin Abi Talib said, there are eight things you got to do. Eight things. If they are not intact, no prayers are going to be answered. Get those eight things in order. Read those eight things. Homework. I gave you the whole thing. Homework is a little too easy. But come on. Self-esteem. You know, white psychology, brown psychology. Forget about all of this. This is the way more important you know, problem on the table. No prayer is ever going to be answered. I think I'd rather be an Aussie and still get, you know, a brown Aussie and still get all of my prayers answered. I'm okay with no self-esteem and still have my prayers answered. I'm just giving you an example of how big of a loss it is as an individual if you're not together as a group. I'm a nobody and nobody gets nothing. Allah only listens to people who are strong. Imagine the odds. If I'm strong, Allah's going to make me stronger? Yeah. Same philosophy in Bible. Same philosophy in the Torah. Allah only helps those who are helping themselves as a group. So, Olympics karni padeng, isse kam chas. Hey, Islam makes you start with the Olympics. Start with the Olympics. Imagine how beautiful this philosophy is. Nothing but the Olympics. Sorry, everyone's going to be a global level athlete. Mentally, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, every problem. Okay? That's where the parenting comes in. That's where the individual and, and, and other. I, uh, I'm not going to go into 360 angles. So, let's jump in with the questions. What do you think? How are you going to angle this? Two things I'm going to remind you. Okay, I'll tell you something what I'm going to do. I, I already am uh, going to bring you together. We already have your data. We have all of the data. But there, yes. Yeah. We're going to bring you together. You can, you can uh, this, this is not a compulsion. You can always leave the group. We're going to start getting connected together just to talk about knowledge levels first. This year, knowledge levels. What to do? Concepts so that I can teach my kids as to and bigger questions, challenging questions. Well, if this is right, then you know, how come or, or make some sense out of that concept? Whatever kind of questions that you guys have, especially uh, regarding your kids, because your kids are going to ask a million questions. I'm telling you this right now. And you cannot just sugarcoat a fake answer and give a placebo and think you, you're doing a good job. No, your kid is going to stop asking you questions if you start giving him placebos because he's going to find somebody else and who's going to give him wrong or right answer but at least attempt him to give an answer okay so these groups these live sessions these live interactions are going to be only for that purpose next step we're going to give you new zealand we're going to give you let's just say uh you know uae or wherever so that you guys can you know, come together and then we're going to host uh, arbitration sessions 
so that you can talk and debate. Your kids can actually come together and learn together. Just like social clubs, but with a purpose. With a purpose of getting IQ of Muslims higher. If I can raise your kids' IQ through these kind of platforms, real questions with real candid questions which most of your kids are never going to ask you, Nushaba, Marine, your daughters, some questions are not going to be asked to you. I'm sorry. That's how we are designed as, as Pakistanis or Muslims. We have stopped the courage, we have lowered the courage of our kids to ask straight questions from our own parents. Important questions. And they are asking from their, their classmates and they are getting the wrong answers and they're not telling us. Even if sometimes they feel that like they're getting at the wrong answer, but they're not going to tell us because we make sure they get afraid of us as, as, as able parents. So we're going to get those platforms together so our kids can openly express and get their confusions out before they become atheists or whatever they, they naturally are going to become. And I don't blame them for becoming atheists at 10 or 12. Their parents are not even letting them breathe, for God's sakes. I'm talking about, you know, uh, intellectually. Yes, sir. Jazakallah uh, khair. My name is Hamza. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't attend the, the gathering from the beginning. But I like the, the concept of establishing a system that yeah. every Muslim come together. From, from your experience, do you, th do you see at the moment any organization or any jama'at that actually the establishment uh, is well, based, the based on... Is there. No, 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 based on establishing a system that every single Muslim come together? Or there is no jama'at at the moment working with this? Because 100% there is groups all yeah, no. agreeing with your philosophy as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, the concept, everybody agrees yeah, with so do you think Oh, no, do you agree with the concept though? Yeah. No. That every Muslim should come together. But do you believe there's some Jamaat working hard on this? But where are you from? I'm from Palestine, from Gaza. <laughs> so pray for our brothers and sisters. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's right. Well, you missed the first part. We, we, we tried to go a little, as much detail as we could at that time. But you know, we, uh, all of these people come from a concept. All of these people, girls and boys, come from a concept which meant that all of the Muslims, whoever says la ilaha illallah, is going to get the citizenship of Pakistan. All of us. Ironic that you asked me this question. A practical, a practical example? Of course not. We ruined the hell out of it. But that's what Pakistan's manifesto was. Yeah. That's what we did. A, a struggle that, you know what? As long as you say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you are a Pakistani, you are a Muslim, and this is a system that we're going to establish in the name of Allah and the Prophet, and no law will ever be made which is repugnant to the, the, the Quran or Sunnah. Which is called Pakistan, by the way. Yeah, what I'm saying is, uh, if we do not have the right concept, of, well, the right follow-through, that's what I'm saying. This is the follow-through. This is the follow through of the, the, the people who came after Pakistan was made. Yeah, this, the current understanding of Islam. So when the current understanding of Islam meets the concept of Pakistan, of course, nothing's, Pakistan is nothing. Better understand that. Pakistani is everything. Pakistani is a live human being. Pakistani is what? Just a land, piece of land. So whatever we do, Whatever our belief system is, it's going, to, it's, it's going to happen to Pakistan. So somebody gave us the biggest gift to establish a, you know, a global... This is exactly what Theodore Herzl did to Israel. Israel is a concept that whoever is a born Jew is a national of Israel. Amazing concept. Whatever his belief is, I respect the fact that at least he tried. We should have tried that as Muslims. And even he would have prospered. You know, Jews prospered really well under Muslim rule. They wouldn't have been much of a problem. Now that thing called Israel, that creature, looks like a creature to us because, look at us. Ghazda does not suffer from Israel. I told you, Ghazda suffer from, suffers from me as Muslim. Fractured psychology and philosophy of Muslims. If Muslims were in the right philosophy, Ghazda would have been a place of heaven for all of us. If only I, I as Sahil Adim, 
would fix my philosophy, people in Gaza will prosper. Because I am the guy who's not doing anything about it. Jews are doing everything right, that they are, whatever they believe in. They, I mean, I wish you give 100 marks to the Jews for doing whatever they believe in and zero marks to Muslims for not even doing a single percent of whatever they believe in, whatever they say they believe in. That's what Gaza, Gaza is not looking at Israel or Tel Aviv. Gaza is looking at Islamabad and Mecca and, you know, Sanaa and, 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 and Tehran and everything. And Jakarta is like, dude, why are you calling yourself Muslims for? You just look and be a spectator. That's what Islam was. Any Sahabi would have done that. Umar Khattab would have been a spectator. Three times it happened that a Muslim man or a woman was hurt. One time, not even hurt, just somebody played with her abaya. And the Prophet took the whole army to guard that girl. And you know, the other side, the Jews, they were the Jews. He kicked out everybody. Then how dare you touch the, the abaya of my, my Muslim child? I'm just saying, this is how one system acts. This is what Islam's demand is. This is why I'm saying, unless you act as a people, you're going to die as individuals. We are going to die as individuals. Domestically, in our own emotional turmoils, and politically, as regular inhabitants of some foreign land, even if it is a Muslim, so-called Muslim land. We're not, we're not going to survive. Sorry. Is there any organization? That was the main question. Yeah. Uh, can you give an example? Like, you know, well, I'll tell you something. In Pakistan, how many, how many jamaat in Pakistan? Uh, there are two primarily who are actually... Not two, more than two. From, from Pakistan, but I have been telling Pakistan. There's, no, no, there's, there's plenty of jamaat, but does all the jamaat apply the concept of the land of Islam? No, or working, working to make Pakistan as a land of Islam? For example, I'll give you an example. So let's just say, uh, forgive someone, for example, like say Jama'at Islami, for example, or Tabligh Jama'at. If no, all not. of a sudden... Both of them are not. No, no, no. <laughs> just yeah, I'm just saying. The only, they both the, have a different manifesto. Anyone, let's say today they are taking the leadership. Today they are, they are the government, they are the army, they have the full leadership. Can they apply the concept of the land of Islam, Pakistan? In Jama for Jama'at Islami? Yeah, well, there's a faction there who they might, yeah. Anyone else? Not even them properly. This, this is my question. Is, is it something international? That you believe Jamaat Islami, like in general, they are the only one at the moment. Okay, hold on, hold on. Now I know where you're coming from. Okay, okay, no, no, no. I thought you were just talking about the concept no, of. The, oh, no, no, the concept exists yeah. in, uh, in, in Yemen, in Africa, in Sudan, even in Indonesia. The concept is there because why would. See, as soon as the Khilafah went, Muslims naturally started to think it's a natural you know, question to ask as to. Okay, nation state? Who came up with that? You know, was, is this that like from Adam al Islam? No, nation state is not from Adam al Islam, it's from Winston Churchill. Okay, so it's, which means that unless we have a single body to recognize or reckon with, that's the word, reckon with, we're, we're nobody individuals. As a Pakistanis or as an Indian Muslims or you know, Indonesian Muslims, we're just little sheep out of the flock. Okay, that's simple. Everybody knew, knew the, uh, still knows that. Jamaat Islami didn't publish it, but I know Moduti because I read Moduti. You know, that's, well, I have read Moduti more than I've read anybody else. That's the founder of Jamaat Islami. Okay, just like Sayyid Qutb was in. Uh, so yeah, so both of them had the same vision that you know what? Unless we expand it into and not Amarat, but all of uh, the the Muslim population should act as or come under a single rule and a system. And uh, even if it's ruled by different governors, the system should be single ton. No, it's not. So why is it not happening? That's, that should be the question. If there is a concept, why is it not spreading? Why is there no appeal? You know what I'm saying? The answer is very simple. And it's a two-fold answer. I'm going to give you a simpler answer. The ideology of Tazkiyah Nafs is so attractive. It is so attractive that every selfish man, every timid man, every coward man and woman, anyone is going to be like, oh, this one's for me. 
This one's awesome because I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to live by properly with X amount of dollars per year with that kind of mortgage and that kind of car and those kind of vibes. You know, so win-win is like Pauline philosophy of Christianity. Jesus died on the cross. I can do anything. Yeah, you can do everything except you confess your sins, man. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. And then I'm just going to wait. Then thy, thy kingdom is going to come. That's what Muslims are doing. So all of a sudden when Modudis or Kutubs or whoever, doesn't matter, tomorrow someone else is going to come in and he's going to talk about establishing it. Come on, come together Muslims, come together, form a system. All of a sudden your regular selfish interest will be your biggest enemy because every Muslim individual will be like, dude, I think heaven has other ways than whatever you're prescribing for as well. Because my daddy was not wrong, his daddy was not wrong, and his daddy was not wrong, and his daddy used to listen to Mufti Mank. Or whoever, I don't care. He's going to quote a scholar. I'm not dissing Mufti Mank. What I'm saying is, he's going to have a scholar to quote. And I'll be like, dude, Mufti Mank never said, I'm, this philosophy shouldn't be there. He's talking about values and rituals and you know, behaviors. Why are you thinking he's giving you an ideology? He's not. But this ideology, which is Pauline, by the way, from St. Paul directly, that for what is to see, well, actually, it's for Matthew, because he was a tax letter, and Jesus never said that, for leave what is to Caesar unto Caesar, and leave whatever is to church unto the church, and that's not our job or whatever Caesar does. Our job is whatever the church is supposed to do, and that is to do. Turn the other cheek if somebody else, you know, is still craving to beat me up. That's Pauline philosophy. That's not Muslim philosophy by far. But that is exactly what I think, we think. That's key enough has become. And this is what you're going to find in every Muslim lecture. Women and men, all of them are giving the same lecture. That's key. It's the pinnacle. And you know what? Matter of Allah. Come on. Find Allah. You and your God. That's it. Single line connecting upstairs. Where's the rest of the people? Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Everyone's about nafsi. No, Islam is not about nafsi in this world. Islam is nafsi as a warning for the next world. Like, this will be such a calamity, you'll forget your own. A mother will forget her own son. And she'll be like nafsi. In this planet, those people who will be successful in the hereafter will be those people here who say anfusana. Okay? Not nafsi. Nafsi is a criminal in Islam here and in this planet. That you only thought about yourself? That's how selfish you are? What kind of... Even Dalai Lama doesn't think like this. And you think you're going to get away with this calling yourself a Muslim? Nafsi, Nafsi? This is Tazkiyah Nafs. Tazkiyah Nafs, the job of a Muslim is to make sure everyone's Tazkiyah Nafs is done. The lowest common denominator is value and worth rises. And that's only going to be risen if there is a the whole system is intact. Otherwise, I'm telling you, Dalai Lama is way more of a Muslim on this definition of Islam than any other Muslim that you can measure of this current definition of Islam. He just doesn't say, Ashhadu Allah, ilaha illallah. That's it. Everything else he does way better. And that's the question you cannot also answer. No cleric can answer. What if, you know, Mother Teresa dies? Because you think all of these, sins, all of these things are, these are going to go to hell? And this cleric's like, of course, the compulsory question is, Ashadu Allah, ilaha illallah. Everything else is gone. But your rayans are not going to buy this answer anymore. Because that's not the right answer. The right answer is, if there is a system, there is a proper governance system, a political system, an economical system, a trading system, if that is intact, it doesn't matter how many Mother Teresa's live or die. It doesn't really matter. Because the lowest common denominator is going to be taken care of by the system. We do not need Mother Teresa's because she's a reaction to the lack of the performance of a system. Everybody is. Every good person is. That i got to do it on my own now, buddy, because nobody else is. Yes, sir. You were saying, sir. Uh, I have a Well, I've got a, an observation uh, and also a question. Uh, I think the main problem is that the system stifles 
free thinking. It doesn't okay. allow us to think. Whether it is in Muslim majority countries, that's probably a more of a severe problem than, uh, than in countries like Australia, America, where you are, where I am. The system drastically does, you know, doesn't really allow free, th free thoughts. And that's why there is a big no, no, doubt of you know, thought leaders. That's why the Muslims are suffering from. We don't have thought leaders. I agree what you think, the way you think, is because of the kind of perception that has been made by current Muslim scholarship. No doubt about this. I take the blame as much as anyone else should. We don't give blame. We're Muslims, we take the blame. I am sorry that you think like this. It's not your fault, it's my fault. Again, I'm sorry. So don't take any offense when I take jabs at my last few generations. Because they have made us believe, as Muslims, that Islam is anti-critical thinking. That Islam is anti-questioning, anti-challenge, anti-openness uh, of thought, anti-intellectual. I'm sorry. I, I apologize to you, Ramin, because people like me made you afraid of Islam. Intellectual bar is a bigger load, a burden upon you when you think of Islam. Even though Islam is exactly the opposite. Abdullah bin Abbas stood up in front of the Sahabas and he says, ask me any question from the universe. The word is universe. Universe. And I'm going to answer it from the Quran. Okay. You understand how big of a claim that is? You need to understand how big of a claim that is. All of the Tabeens gave way to the thinking Muslims that came up with all the theories which all of these current scientists are thriving upon. Al Khwarizmi says, My pathways to heavens are in the Quran, and my calculations to those pathways are also in the Quran, which is algebra. You need to understand, he was the most appreciated man in uh, Muslim Ummah, and I and one of those people who are going to be soon banned around Pakistani media because I say mathematics is, Quran gives birth to mathematics or physics or biology. We can improve physics and biology and mathematics if you only knew Quran properly. I opened this project last week in Islamabad. Of course, we're not going to do it in Islamabad because of the climate and weather of uh, that inshallah, my students, a source code, which we're working on right now, are going to install the most powerful telescope in the planet in Pakistan by constructing it themselves. It is that simple. First step, that's first step, that's step one. You know what step two is? Step two is not just looking at it, aiming for it. That's how rocket and rocket science is made. This is pure space science. Because I know my prophet told me, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That this is the first heaven, Muzayyana Sama'a Dunya. This is the Sama'a Dunya which is adorned by the stars. There's 500 years of water, and then there's another. And then there's 500 years of water, and then there's another. And there's seven heavens. And this scientist thinks this microwave background is the oh, Big Bang, and everything else is explained. No, it's not. That's just your first heaven, at best. Muslims have a way bigger geometry of the universe, which non-Muslims can't even comprehend, let alone do the math for. If we can actually put the symmetry of Islam and Islamic teaching inside our children so that they can actually re-improve pure physics and mathematics, that's when people are going to run after Muslims as holders of the Quran. Because I know, and I'm going to present it to you, inshallah, all of my faculty members are working day and hard, and I can do it right now, but this is not the topic of how I'm going to open the mathematics in front of you and algebraic topology, I'm going to prove through Hazrat Uzair salam when Allah Azawajal killed him and made him come to life muscle fiber by muscle fiber. Right in front of him. That's topology right there. Measured by algebra right there. Calculus is what? Rate of change of something compared, 
or in relative to something else. We can now do the math on this one. What do you think Hassale is, you know, the she camel came out. What do you think? Lights went out and all of a sudden lights came out. There was a big camel. No. The whole process of that camel came out. Coming. Of course, it happened in nanoseconds, but it went as, came as a process. These are all signs. And the way we are taught Quran, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرَانَ عَلَى الْجَبَلِ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَشِيًا مُتَصَدِّيًا مِنْ خَشِيَةِ اللَّهِ Muslims are been, being taught as if this is نَوْزُ بِاللَّهِ poetry. Why? Because Allah Ta'ala says, تِلْكَ الْأَمْسَالُ نَظْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ That if Allah Ta'ala bestowed, or you know, this was descended upon a mountain, this Quran, the mountain would have disintegrated. And then you know what Allah Ta'ala says? Allah Ta'ala doesn't say it is poetry. Allah Ta'ala says, this is an example so that you can use your brain. Use your brain as to what I'm trying to say here. This is an ayah of the Quran. Ayah means a sign that this, this is something way bigger than what you're comprehending right now. This is not poetry. When Allah is saying, use it as a sign, we are saying, oh, these are mutashabihats. Na'udhu billah. Allah Ta'ala is saying, لَعَلَّكُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And Muslims are saying, no, these are mutashabihat. This is what Pakistani scholarship is. This is a mutashabihat. You think Allah is going to say mutashabihat and then say, use your brain on mutashabihat? You think this is not a reason why our kids are running away from Islam? Because these Dawkins and Hawkins are giving them the answers. They're not going to use the Quran. They're going to use something which is against the Quran. You know what that is? Just primal psychology, biased, loaded statements, raking with nothing but their own shame of them being Christians in their own age of whatever, you know, that, 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 that natural psychology of a Christian would be reactive the way Paul did whatever he did with the Bible. Any Christian becoming an atheist, I don't blame him. I don't just blame. Actually, I've recognized Richard Dawkins as one of those guys. Like, Good job, man. Somebody should come out of this Pauline book called Bible. God didn't write it. Paul wrote it. Some guy wrote it. So yeah, you better be repulsed from it. But you just start jabbing at the Quran. Most of these people have not even read a single surah of the Quran. Some even just five or six hand-picked ayahs so that they can make fun and try and use their podiums as their arguments. So that our kids can think, oh, you know what, this guy... He's a scientist and he thinks Quran is you know, saying this and that. He, may, he must be right. That's not. If a scientist says something stupid, it doesn't make it scientific. It just remains stupid. Okay? Yes, sir. Thanks, Brother Sahil, for awakening our thoughts. So my question is, uh, you have mentioned quite thought-provoking ideas. So how we can inculcate these ideas in ourselves, in our generation? And when we say our generation, these generations are rather becoming proactive to be become or bring any system. They are struggling with deism, um, and imminence, these imminence and the transcendence are the main concept. Where they understand one thing, they can accept it. And when they struggle to understand something, this thing exists either in Quran, in Sunnah, or in our uh, Aslaf. And if they cannot understand this thing through transcendence, they disagree with it and deny it. And that's how they become away from Islam or deen. So what would be the starting point from them? So rather than become the part of deism or atheism, how they can become the effective or active person to bring this system which you are talking about. Let me give you an example. And one last thing, when at the starting point, Islam say, Quran say, Avalam yakfihim anna anzalna alaykal kitab, Book is already there. Still, we are confused. What would be the starting point for us in this country? Thank you. I think, I personally believe that people in Australia or America or England, well, especially Scandinavia, especially Scandinavia, zoom in, man, zoom in, especially Scandinavia. I'll tell you why I said Scandinavia, okay? Uh, because most people think America is calling the shots, but no. Scandinavia is calling the shots on what? Psychology of our Muslim child. Not just Muslim, every child. They're calling the shots, they're orchestrating it really well. In about 10 years from now, you're going to see Norwegian and 
Finnish, well not Finnish, but at least Swedish, as one of those languages daughters and sons are going to be speaking through Netflix or whatever you're going to learn it from. They're naturally going to be pulled towards it. Okay. School systems and your educational norms are going to be set by Scandinavia. Just a little word to the wise. Now, your question is simple. I personally believe that Muslims in Arab or Turkey or uh, Pakistan, India or, you know, wherever the Muslim majority is, not India, sorry, India is not a majority, but India has a, you know, a flavor of so many, 30, three point, uh, 350 million uh, Muslims in uh, India, so I'm not going to just call it a minority, but Muslims in Indonesia, Pakistan, Arabs and all of that, they, they are going to take their sweet time because of the two or three blocks at their intellectual and emotional core. They're going to take their time. And change is going to happen from, from them. Because overseas Muslims are not enough, sorry. Even if all the Arabs, all the non-Arabs combine overseas and they do whatever they can, they're not enough in number to you know, bring a bigger change. If Muslims in Arab and uh, Africa and you know, Ind Indonesia and Pakistan, they combine or they start changing, it's going to happen like this. Because, you know, 90% of us are still in Muslim lands. Now, but the problem is, Muslim land is a depleted land in three different realms. Number one, intellectual core. Not just money. Money is number three. Number three is money. Resources, the least amount of resources we have is Muslim lands. Okay. The least amount of intellect, yeah, Muslim lands. Okay, that's a problem overseas Muslims can solve right away. Pakistanis cannot solve it in Pakistan, sorry. I apologize. I'm a Pakistani. We should understand where the problem is. If I'm not going to admit the stick is broken, I'm not going to fix it. So kids in Canberra, better light the torch for kids in Islamabad. Better. Because you have the handicap right now. Right now, you are exposed, you're well structured. I'm not talking about mannerism, because Australia has way better mannerism than Pakistan, okay? If anyone wants to do tazkiyah, they should bring their kids for two, three years. Their kids will have awesome tazkiyah and then they pay, take back our belief system and everything, okay? I'm not talking about, I'm talking about that knowledge set, that exposure, that aperture, that I general IQ, and then in those fields which actually matter, you train your kids, for God, especially daughters. Train your kids in STEM fields which are going to take over as soon as enough Muslims enter into the intellectual world. For example, name any three Muslims who have won the Fields Medal. And I'm not saying that's the oh, purpose of life. Fields. No, no, no. I'm just saying it's a little test going on in the world. Everybody jumps into it. Any three Muslims? Can you believe that? Can you, can you believe that you guys cannot tell three names? And you're in camera. At least you know what a Fields Medal is. So Muslims are not entering the field's medal. I'll tell you what's the problem. I'm not here to project mathematics or physics. I'm here to project Quran, right? The problem is, you only follow the book of the guy who's calling the shots on the guys. If your alpha is not holding the Quran, you're not going to hold the Quran. If your alpha is holding, what's the word? Uh, but the Bible, you're going to hold the Bible. If your Alpha is holding mathematics, you're going to hold mathematics. Whatever your Alpha is, when a superior psychology comes in, every inferior psychology mimics it and starts to become that superior psychology. That's basic common science. Not science, science. Everyone wants, that's why I asked you, if given a chance, if given a chance, Muslims jump into the, what's the word, STEM fields, and with this current psychology, they're going to the STEM fields. And I'm telling you, overseas Muslims are going to jump into mathematics or physics naturally, because probability says that. Even if you don't want them to, they are still going to pick up physics or chemistry or math or biology, right? and computer sciences, and some of them 
One of them is going to feel that, like the Iranian child, she, she, she's like the most wonderful human being that came in from Iran and just feel, won the field's well, right? So someone else is going to do that. But they're not going to project Islam. You know why? Because they're going to be chasing mathematics for the sake of mathematics. I need you to understand my purpose is not STEM. I want STEM as an instrument because I know how psychology works. So if a Muslim child tells the world that I found this mathematics, the urge and the surge of mathematics through the Quran, then people are going to follow the Quran because of its credibility of mathematics. That's what I want our kids to be. You guys are halfway there. I'm not talking about camera. Halfway means you are not those people who are ashamed of Islam. I swear to you, you will be if you do not change the definition of self-esteem and self-worth right now. Because your kids will be confused and their kids will be ashamed. And we have started the confusion, the ball of confusion right now. Ask any child. He's going to know way more about the identity he relates to, which has nothing to do with Islam, than the identity he relates to, which has everything to do with Islam. 1% of the Muslim household, 1% is actually training the Muslim on the Prophet ﷺ's seerah. 1%. And Hussein al-Salam said, there was not a man, a boy in child who was not trained on the Maghazi. Not a boy left in Arab who is not trained on Maghazi. You know Maghazi? Yeah. That's the model. That's, you know, I just, I just, today or maybe yesterday night, this uh, CNN or Fox, Fox, this black guy and this uh, Alan Dershowitz fighting with each other, and they're claiming that, oh, uh, Palestinians are trained to hate Israeli Jews. Look at the school curriculum, and they're showing kids their videos. You know, even though literally every school in Israel does that. Okay? And Palestinians don't get trained on oh, how to hate a Jew or how to kill a Jew. They actually are indoctrinated, the, 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 the Jewish kids. But... Uh, you know, this, this, this uh, what's his girl, Hannity or whatever his name is, this newscaster. And Alan, Alan Dershowitz is, as usual, being himself. And this, this black Harvard professor is running for pre uh, pre uh, president of America this, this time. He's the one who's, you know, defending the, he's not saying that, oh, uh, you know what, uh, hail, I'm hollering to the Muslims. He's saying, you know what, call a spade a spade, man. When a Palestinian child dies, nobody cries. And this time you're making up this 40 children there. And everyone's crying. I said, child is a child. So it's a neutral stance. I'm not for that guy. What I'm saying is, as soon as, as soon as I heard that clip, I saw that video, I was like, hold on. Are you telling me that you know that this basic psychology framework is applicable and is being done somewhere. So a child needs to be taught. And that's, if, it's not, if it's not a child, or if it's my age, or it's somebody else, it's not going to work. So it has to be a child that has to be trained at the right age on the right emotional spectrum so that the values and the whole emotional makeup is set up. And if it is set up once, it's done for life. So the technique is there. Everybody knows it. We just don't do it. You know who does it? I'll tell you, Aslam, who does this? YouTube. And YouTube is not going to train your child Sira. He's going to train your child Kim Kardashian. And whatever is related, the whole algorithm. The algorithm is not spread around. And even if he does, for example, even if he does go into Islamic literature, this is what he's going to get. He's not going to get the real and right answers. That's a vicious circle. And all the Muslim turbans are going to be hanging around him and he'll be like, oh, you know what? I am, uh, I'm doing everything right. But nothing's going to happen. Nothing. That's what I'm saying. I need physicists and mathematics from your households. I swear, they're, they're, they're the pawns in the game, I'm telling you. The real king on the board is your son or daughter. You know who's that? That 
child is going to be the philosopher who is going to bring all the Muslims together in the ideology of Islam. He's going to use the mathematicians and the physicists and the biologists. She's born, I'm telling you, maybe this is the girl. Look at her. Maybe, you know, maybe she is it. Because we need a child of this age because I need that 20 years of learning momentum because right now, even if I start right now, I still need 20 years. So if I get 20 years, I'm not going to survive. She has, inshallah, way more than 20 years. I might as give her, might as well just give her the momentum, make her the philosopher, and she's going to touch the whole, or, you know, show the light to the whole world. But I'm not using this child's age as a factor. I'm treating her like a six-year-old. Every woman is. Brother, my related question is, if you take it, then it will be addition to you. کہ آپ ایک سائیکولوجسٹ میں اردو میں بات کروں گی ایک سائیکولوجسٹ ہوتے ہوئے آپ نے ریلیٹ کیا امیگریشن کو اور ہماری سیلف اسٹیم کو ایز این امیگرنٹ جو شروع میں آپ جب میں نے کنیکٹ کیا تھا تو آپ کو کیا لگتا ہے کہ ہم اپنے بچوں کو کیسے ان کی سیلف اسٹیم اسٹرانگ کر سکتے ہیں جب کہ ہماری اپنی سیلف اسٹیم اسٹرانگ نہیں ہے اور ہم مطلب فسٹ جنریشن جو کہ اوور سیز آئے ہیں آپ نے کہا کہ دو تین جنریشن کے بعد وہ سیلف اسٹیم ختم ہو جائے گی Listen, I'll give you a formula for self-esteem. It's not my formula. It's, it's not because I'm a Muslim or anything. It's a non-Muslim formula. It's called Viktor Frankl, okay? Listen to me, I'm, I'm gonna be very clear, neutral. If Allah is not the reason why you do everything, then you're not, you better not have any self-esteem. Then you're becoming narcissist. You're becoming Satan in Firan. You need to understand that. You're not supposed to have self-esteem unless it is God-oriented. You have to do everything for Allah. In Islam, the concept is very simple. Vala ul bara. What is vala ul bara? Anybody? Think about it. Any, no, you haven't heard about this? Vala ul bara? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's saying it? Well, no, that's the phrase. In Arabic, it means uh, I love for Allah and I hate for Allah. Okay? I love whoever I love for Allah and I hate whoever. I mean, I am going to be close to somebody for Allah and I'm going to be away from somebody for the sake of Allah. Balal, bara means barat. Barat means, you know, to let go, let's like abstain. And wala means balayat. Dosti. Okay? Balal, bara. So, self esteem is what? What is self-esteem? Walaul bara, central core, self-esteem. So I'm just telling you this right now. Unless you know the Prophet unless you know him, because he's the only example of true God orientation. So make her Muhammad, otherwise please do not give her self-esteem. Because if she gets that other self-esteem, like Kim Kardashian's self-esteem, then she is going to be the problem for everybody else. Her esteem is going to bulldoze everybody else. You understand me? I'll show you some women and men with self-esteem and no Islam. You think they don't have self-esteem? Of course they have self-esteem. You think Pharaoh did not have self-esteem? Oh, awesome self-esteem. So self-esteem is not the purpose. The purpose actually begets self-esteem. Purpose is the purpose. Self-esteem is not the purpose. Self-esteem is a byproduct, which is of course necessary. Unless we have self-esteem and self-worth and self-confidence, how dare you walk the streets of Canberra as a Muslim? You know, those black people in the 70s had million more times self-esteem in slave America than Muslims right now in free Australia and free America. Imagine that. And we are not even 1% in the criminal registry rate that the blacks are in the American registry rate. Most of the crimes are committed by the, that community. And still, they're not ashamed of the fact that I didn't commit a crime and I'm still gonna stand my ground. And here, I'm, as a Muslim, I'm the first man I'm gonna change. You know what today I found out? Today, I found out that there's so many Muslim Australians who have not registered themselves as Muslims. 
Sir, this is a related Did question. Did you know that? Everybody knew that in this room? There is a sizable chunk of Muslims who have told Australia that they're not Muslims. Sir, this question is also kind of related, but it's a collective question, so um, I'm asking on some people which are not here. So basically, um, it's how to deal with the downplays and mockery that women, especially uh, professional young parents, who choose to stay home for parenting reasons. How do we do, deal You're with that? You're being mocked for staying home as a woman? Yes, we do. And we get downplays. And this is a collective question. Is that something question. new, for, uh, surprising for you guys? It's like I. Yeah, so. And this is a collective question. No, it's not. Everybody's denouncing it. Do you think women are being denounced in Australia for staying home as Muslims? I don't. <laughs> that's a surprise this, for me. This is this is a this is a collective question. So that's an question. exception. That's not a rule. We don't. That's a, it's not a rule. Yeah. You are going through that. No doubt about this. But. Are it's a you? collective question. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, let me get this straight. Are you telling me that in Australia, women, well, you guys, Muslim women, I'm going to shrink the sample by calling Muslim women, otherwise general women can also be applicable here. That you guys are being ridiculed for not for being home, for being home, for being home. Ridiculed for staying home and taking care of your kids. It's okay, don't be so loud. I get that you are two people. Raise your hands if you know that what I'm, this is what I'm talking about. You guys go through some, some sort of battery. People call you useless. You don't have a job, you're a useless slot. Okay. Yeah. By whom? By whom? By women? Well, it both, it's both ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. You tell me the break, I'll break. Because we're going to break now. Because I've taken enough questions. Listen, I got to go to. Uh, uh, let me just give you a schedule. Uh, the macro schedule is we're going to be in contact for uh, coming together in social media only, like uh, Zoom sessions only. And I'm going to be sending you the next sessions from Melbourne and uh, Sydney and uh, Perth and all the sessions on those groups. And uh, so that you can know what happened after this, okay? After this, because uh, I'm going to add on, a f well, not add on, I'm going to build up prior to this and add on a lot of uh, into this in Sydney because I got to build the context because uh, they didn't attend this session so I got to build this context. But in Melbourne it's a totally different uh, inshallah session, totally different session. It's a concept that is the same but I'm angling it differently and I might just take it to Perth uh, with uh, the angle of Melbourne. So I have to leave right now. The group will have all the questions that you will have, just write it down, and uh, I will definitely be a part of that group myself, that WhatsApp group, so that you can ask me directly. I am a part of no WhatsApp group anymore. This will be a WhatsApp group first this year for me, so that I can attend to you, because this is an awakening tour. I need to be aware of what you guys are asking. You, I will be coming in, inshallah, once, at least once a month, for two or three hours on Zoom, so that all of us can come together, not in this room, but you know, in your own comfort of your own homes, that we can talk, and you can come up with uh, multiple arrays of uh, ideas and suggestions as to how to you know, improve that next step that I'm going to propose, or you can propose, and we can discuss and improve that. So, any any uh, question before the namaz break? Then uh, we will not just get a namaz break; we will take a Sydney break. Okay. What I have is a. Uh, a long drive. I am not flying. I'm driving there, and uh, I have not slept for the last 48 hours for you guys. I couldn't even sleep, even if I wanted. I tried last night. I just couldn't. So what I'm saying is, uh, 
there's a lot of times I, I miss out on my next word because of this reason. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, you can ask a few questions. It's all right. One more question. That's, I promise it's the last one. No, you will be in so, the mic, though. Okay. So um, my question is, what knowledge or teachings can we give our children or for the future generation or the young generation um, with what you have talked about today with in perspective of... Um, Don't take the mic in, out. In pers sorry. <laughs> in perspective of um, the psychological and the other teachings we ha you have given. So, yeah, that's the question. Okay, I'll tell you. And, um, I'll tell you a list also, of things that sorry, you are uh, as a, um, are you a mother? Yeah, yeah, I'm a mother. Yeah, so. I'll tell you what a mother, uh, in the first five years, in the next five years, in the next five years. I'll tell you a, a general perspective. Other than role modeling and teaching the way of life in the, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, don't worry. I'll, uh, there's a... Okay, there's some certain things a man cannot do to his kids in terms of build up. I cannot do. That's the job of a woman. And she's gifted by Allah so that she can deliver that, that uh, expertise that she has, that competence. And then there's certain things a man can do which you cannot. Okay? Don't try. Don't, don't get tired. But that comes after the 12th and 13th year of a child's life. We become real fathers after the 13th year, which we don't, by the way, we've absolved ourselves from the duty. After the 12th and 13th year, we need to take him in the ship and make sure that he travels with us every day. Okay? In the next six, seven years, after he's 17, 18, 19, you're not supposed to be in his ship, nor is he supposed to be in your ship. Okay? But we don't do that. We don't model a child like this. We make sure that our child stays with us for 20 years and then he becomes my biggest advocate, my biggest lawyer against whatever is going to happen if something happens to me. So you're treating him as like a business asset. Okay? That's mighty selfish of you and if we were just selfish, I would have been okay because I'm used to selfish people, everybody is. But that's malicious. You're killing the capability. You're ruining the fabric of that child's not only innocence, but the bigger purpose as well. Muslim children are not supposed to grow up to protect their mothers. That's not the purpose of Muslim boys. Muslim boys are supposed to grow up to protect all women. Okay, you are raising Muslim child to protect you against other women of the family. His family. And you know that, you know, it's all right. You are a poop of somebody, you know. So we have gone through this. That's why we never respect women. You know why? Because our woman, the mother, disrespected the other women, our poopos or whoever, or daddy. And then all of a sudden you're we like, okay, it's not every woman. It's just one woman that I'm supposed to protect. Okay? You know what you're doing? You're killing the capability of your own Muslim son. And then you make sure he watches Urtagal. And all of a sudden, he, you know what he goes through? I'm a lower inferior being. Because I can't even do the math on how these guys are thinking. All Urtagal had was a good mother. Nothing else. A fair mother. That's the power that you have which we can't possibly replace because the child is not going to be with us. We don't have wombs or the cradles or the patience or the temperament to raise a child from zero to ten or you know whatever age that you can easily do. Okay? Yes. Last question, please. So I have one more question. Can I uh, just ask a question? Sure, right after her. Yes. to join, um, uh, to raise the kids. Uh, but I'm thinking, uh, I can, I'm fine without that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, in my, uh, like my observation is saying that the, uh, if tw for 12 uh, years, only the women is, uh, 
raising the kids and most of the duties are performing by a mother. 12 years, the Pakistani man, uh, after 12 years, it is very difficult to engage a Pakistani Muslim man or husband, partner to engage um, in raising the child. So what strategies, like uh, how like we can engage them? Your husband? I'm at a stage, I'm having difficulty. Your husband? You want to engage your husband? Yes. How do you engage him to get married to you? It was arranged marriage. Well, you, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. After that, you engage him plenty. Yes. Like, uh, it's not Listen, I'll tell you something honestly. I'll tell you something. Forget psychology, just co common sense. A man is the easiest easiest prey for any woman. <laughs> and you can't even prey on your own man. That's your incompetence. Make sure you understand that. A girl who, or a woman, who is going to be half as competent as you are, because he's not going to know anything about him, is going to capture his attention and engagement 24-7 right in front of you with half the wits that you have. You have all the data about this guy and you still cannot capture him and engage him? I can, no, uh, I can but not for the kids. I can engage him, but he is... Oh, we know that. That's what I'm saying. You have a noble purpose and we know that you can engage him. We just want you to think about the child and make sure that you understand the man's psychology. Now, most men that I know, <laughs> most Pakistani men that I know, they treat their wives as their mothers. I keep telling them, why did you get married, man? You should have told your father to get married. You wanted a mommy. Why did you get married? Psychologically, all you wanted was a mommy. Then you should have asked dad, why don't you get another wife? Because I like to, you know, obey orders and, you know, be subservient. That's what classical man child is doing right now. He's just not living up to his potential of, and you know what most women, you guys want a leader in the house. You need the leader in the house. You judge him for not being enough leader as a man, as a, as, as, as a fair, true, highly scoped leadership material that you want in a man. Actually, you throw a lot of sarcastic comments which provo provocative speeches come from wives about men not being enough men to their husbands. And that actually is, you know, pretty hurtful, actually as much as it gets. And can possibly get. So if you want the men to be men, but when they want to be men, other than the scope that requires, you know, them being men around you, all of a sudden you want them to be women. And not just women, your daughters. You want your husbands to become literally like your daughters, like no masculinity altogether, just, a, you know, screaming in this box, and be a man in this box. That's not how man, manhood works, okay? This is supposed to be a very wonderful creature, this man. Look at him. <laughs> wonderful. All the progress in the planet has been done by this creature, not this creature. All the progress, all the inventions, all the science, all the space science, all the mechanical science, all the industry, this guy. Not this guy. And you want to lower the potential of this guy? Use him. He's a perfect slave. For the biggest good of progress. No, as a, as a son. As your sons. Not as your husbands. He's the perfect, perfect candidate for the progress of all human beings. Your daughters, their daughters, their granddaughters. I'm trying to wake the woman in you. You need to understand that. Zero inventions, zero progress, zero literature, zero intellectual acumen. Nothing comes from the womankind. Yeah, 
Very seriously. Actually, so serious that I'm crying about this. <laughs> Actually, I can. I'll tell you why. Because if it were not that general, we would have had at least noticeable examples. Give me three Nobel, oh, forget Nobel Prize, you know, but that's too high. That's too high. Let's just lower the threshold. Which is a woman famous for her intellectualism? Oh, oh, no, hold on, hold on, let me finish the question. I'm going to make it very easy for you. That's it? That's it? That's what you got? No, 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 I know, I know. I want, I want girls to argue. See, I, I'm not, listen, I need you to argue all your life. I'll tell you why. I do not find enough girls arguing. Okay? When you say that in a thousand years of this history of human beings, human beings have achieved this and that, okay? We all know that we mean men. And I'm not a proud of it because I'm a man. I have daughters. I need women to be, at least, if not more, than at least significant contributors to the progress of human beings. Forget 50-50 or whatever. I don't care. It's not a competition. But you didn't even enter the competition if it were one. One writer, you want to compare the list? You want to give me 10? No, you can't. I'll tell you why. Oh, ho. No, no, keep going. Why did you why did you stop at two? Why did you stop at two? Keep keep keep, keep, keep naming names. Because that's all you got. No, give me give me more names. Oh, I need more names for the sake of my daughter's name is hijab. Listen. You're not listening to my question. I'm helping you. My daughter's name is hijab. I need more names for hijab. There are not enough names, that's what I'm saying. Maybe you enter this 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 this. This campus late. All I'm saying is God gave you bigger brains. And we happen to use it better? No, we didn't. Look at the moral compass of the man. We're not using our brains better. The, the fact is, we're not even using it enough, you know, as much as any other animal is using its brain for, you know, given the fact that, you know, whatever proportion of brain it got. And still, I don't see enough girls in the battlefield, especially intellectual, especially towards the progress of the bigger numbers. Okay, you're not here to have babies. You're here to make human, great human beings. Otherwise, this is gonna happen, look at us. Look at us, can't even cross the street without getting confused as to where is my morality. Where did it go? Did I, even, did, I, did I even have it to begin with? Can't argue myself out of any culture, ethnicity, creed, philosophy, ideology. Can't. Imagine the irony of that guy who gets inspired by every YouTube video. Imagine. How low can that guy be? He gets inspired by every single category of videos. So this is a problem. You know how it started? Because standards are too low. The benchmarks are too low, okay? I hope and I pray more women jump into the, calling the shots on, you know, how to raise IQs and, you know, raise the IQs. And I'm talking about girls as smartest girls in the world. No, no, no. I'm talking about girls wise enough to write about how to raise, you know, the IQs or, or make smart people let alone girls or boys. I'm talking about contribution towards invention of, or improvisation at least, of how to maneuver ourselves out of these problems that we're you know, stuck in. If, in. if not intellectual core, then at least in the social uh, you know, clusters that we've already isolated ourselves into. 
We can, on women can easily, because you know what your experience index is, your spectrum is way, way wider. You could have given a way quicker solution because you feel the problem way deeper. And you know what, we're just hoaxing it out, but still giving our solution. Hoaxing it, but still giving it. And sometimes, you know, the, the, the shoe fits, and you know, the, the bullet hits the target, and you know, we, we, we claim the throne, and then all of a sudden, patriarchal this and patriarchal that. No, that, that's not gonna jive with me. Patriarchy, patriarchy did not step on you. Anyone would have stepped on you. You didn't rise up. That's what I'm saying. And Islam gives you enough of an arsenal to fight the intellectual fight. You have examples like Aisha uh, bin Abi Bakr, who, when Abdullah bin Abbas, the creator of the scholars, comes in and he shows his confidence, and Aisha bin Abi Bakr says, you're not going to teach me of, on how to think about Islam. I'm going to tell you of what Islam is. Okay? Because he's talking about the Quran, Surah Najm, and Miraj, and the, Allah, the Prophet Islam, seeing Allah Azawajal, and she says, listen, you're crossing a line which only a non-Muslim would cross. I don't care for your intellectual core because you're underestimating the power of belief, power of belief, or the power of intellect. This is how simple, you know, I'm gonna make it to you, that if you have your self-worth, self-esteem developed as a woman or as a man, I mean, in this case, as a woman, doesn't matter the biggest scholar of your t the time, the biggest scholar of the time comes in, you're still gonna Stand your ground and teach him a lesson. And he says, you know, she did teach me a lesson. Ummul Mu'mineen taught me a lesson. I'm never going to forget. Oh, yeah, yeah. Umar al-Khattab. Da Umar al-Khattab. Which a regular man would just, you know, just shy away and like, I can't, I can't even face him, let alone argue with him. And this girl stands up and he says, and not just one, al did that. And you know what he said about al That I'm trying to evade al every time I see him. So I need confidence that that sister, that, girl, that, that little girl, oh, what's her name? I'm sorry. Anam? Anha. Anha. I need more Anhas, you know, stirring the whole thing up. We need them. You need them. I have daughters, so I need her, you know, but you need them. So that, the, you know, the snowball starts rolling and, you know, you all of a sudden become, that's what useful is. Somebody says useless for you know, whatever category that you were. This is, I'm complaining, you're useless, or you are, if you're not mentally, intellectually active, activating other people and getting the things done. Professor Sam said, if you're today, it's not better than yesterday, you have not embraced Islam yet. Now I'm paraphrasing, of course, he's used the word moment. A moment is a moment whose tomorrow is better than today. There has to be a progress meter and there has to be a visible change. What kind of change? We don't even measure change. And you know what? I swear, I'm telling you, this guy, boy, grown guy, he says, sir, now I pray five times. Yesterday I wasn't. God, are you kidding me? That's not today or yesterday. You are not even a Muslim yesterday, man. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, don't want you to miss your asas. I got to pray as Zohar well together, so I got to run. Okay, so uh, we got to run. We got to run, like literally run. Uh, I really want to thank you for your patience and time. I really appreciate this. I must, I must uh, tell you that you are the reason I am carrying the torch of hope. I had given up. I swear I had given up. Okay? It is your pressure, your vigor, your zest and zeal that is giving me hope. There are no coincidences. chance pe or a tukke pe nahi I am. Allah ke tukke nahi hai. Dunia ke kone mein mein aage hoon aur aap loon ke saamne khada hoon. Yeh tukka nahi laga wa, okay? Kisi vira se aapko yeh baate sunnai gai hai, kisi vira se mere muh se gai. Only Allah makes the tongue move. I can't even think unless Allah wants me to think. Let alone speak. That requires a lot of muscles, you know? So, I am leaving with hope and I'm leaving with 
enough contentment that, you know what, as long as we delivered a certain message, it will have some echoes in our personal lives and hopefully our communal life. Hopefully. Communal life, yeah. That's, and if you're not connected, sorry. Then you know what, we were just, we were just playing game with our own kids. If we're not connected for, for the sake of our kids, then we're not sincere with our own kids. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for coming all the way. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take care. Sure, sure, of course. I'm a bird better now. I'm a surgeon. Oh. Look, I, I became a better Muslim because of these guys. So I had to actually read the Quran myself so yeah. I can teach them. My wife was a big old teacher. We have a lot of and these guys, they stand up and they offer the praise in the Lord's voice.